dikuasai untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat. Meningkatkan kualitas tata kelola organisasi yang baik dan membangun jejaring dengan stakeholder yang efektif dan efisien. Pada program studi S1 Teknologi Industri Pertanian, terdapat tiga bidang kajian. Teknologi rekayasa proses pengolahan agroindustri, teknik sistem dan manajemen agroindustri, dan teknologi lingkungan agroindustri. Well, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Our opening ceremony is about to begin. Please have a nice seat and back to your position. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our online Zoom meeting. We proudly present the International Conference on Sustainable Agriculture and Biosystem, ICSEB 2021. By them, towards sustainable, sustainable agriculture, agriculture and, and biosystem bio in a pandemic. pandemic. It's being a great honor for us to be standing here and welcome each and every one of you from Andalas University, Padang, Indonesia. ICSEB is an annual program which conducted by Department of Agriculture, Engineering and Biosystem, Andalas University, and this year will be the fourth year this program held. We deeply wish to meet you to standing and celebrate this event, but due to the pandemic situation, this conference arranged by online Zoom meetings, and we wish you all in a great conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, over the next few hours, this meeting will provide you plenty of opportunities to discuss, share knowledge, and insight. Before we proceed the program today, we would like to express our sincere gratitude to Excellency, Director of Andalas University, Professor Dr. Yuliandri, Representative by Associate Professor Dr. Hafizal Handra, Honorable Dean of Agricultural Technology Faculty, Associate Professor Dr. Ferry Arlius, along with its ranks, Honorable Chairman of Conference, Associate Professor Dr. Kandra Fahmi, Honorable Speaker Professor Hiroki Owe from Ehime University, Japan. Honorable Speaker Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Rasdi Zaini from University Technology Mara, Malaysia. Honorable Speaker Associate Professor Dr. Engineering Muhammad Maki from Andalas University, Indonesia. Honorable Speaker, Professor Sajif Ratan Sharma from Punjab Agricultural University, India. Honorable Speaker, Dr. Wida Susanti Haji Suhaili from University Technology Brunei, Brunei Darussalam. Honorable Speaker, Associate Professor Indira Prabasari, PhD from Universitas Muhammadiyah, Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Excellency Distinguished Guests, Honorable Distinguished Speakers, Participants, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. Go on to the next agenda, singing the National Anthem of the Republic of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya.
Excellencies, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we would like to invite to deliver a report from the Chairman of Conference, Associate Professor Dr. Kandra Fahmi. Please give a warm applause. Uh, re representative by Vice Rector for Development, Planning and Collaboration, Associate Professor Dr. Hefrizal Hendra, my honorable to the Dean of Faculty Agricultural Technology and Alash University, Associate Professor Dr. Ferry Arlius, my honorable to the keynote speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Rasdi Zaini, from U UITM Malaysia, Professor Dr. Hiroki Owe from United Graduate School of Agriculture Science, Ehime University, Professor Sajif Ratan Sarma from Punjab Agricultural University, India, Professor Associate Professor Indira Prabasari, the Dean of Faculty Agriculture, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Yogyakarta. Associate Professor, Associate Professor Dr. Wida Susanti Haji. Professor Dr. Eng Muhammad Maki from Faculty of Agricultural Technology and Dallas University. Distinguished guests and participants, gentlemen. We are delighted to welcome you to the 2020 National Conference on Sustainable Agriculture and Biosystem at Padang West Sumatra, Indonesia. This conference is organized by Faculty of Agriculture, Technology, and Dallas University in collaboration with Faculty of Plantation and Agrotechnology, University Technology, Mara, Malaysia, and supported by Ehime University, Japan, University Muhammad Dia, Yogyakarta, University Technology, Brunei, Punjab University, India. ICSIB 2021 is the first conference held by Faculty of Agricultural Technology, Andalas University. The theme of the conference in this year is Towards Sustainable Agriculture and Biosystem in a Pandemic. Although this conference is carried when the world faced the COVID-19 pandemic, however, it did not reduce the enthusiasm of researchers to participate in this event. Through this, we are proud to provide an appropriate platform for discussion and information, transfer of current research, new technological innovation, and practical application in disciplines relating to sustainable agriculture and biosystem. 131 paper will present presentation are printed in this booklet. Selected full paper presented during this conference are being prepared to be published in EOP proceeding. The insect and hard work for both of technical and organizing committee have made this conference possible. Its member of the committee made a significant contribution toward the success of the event. And we thank everybody for their valuable support. Finally, on behalf of the conference advisory board and organizing committee, I would like to express and science thanks and appreciation to the Rector of Andalas University, all participants, college keynote speaker, as well as UITM for the indispensable support in organizing this scientific meeting. Thank you very much for attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Associate Professor Dr. Kandra Fahmi for the report. Excellencies, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite.
to giving welcoming address from the Dean of Agricultural Technology Faculty, Associate Professor Dr. Ferry Arlius. Please give a warm applause. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning to all of you. The Excellency Rector of Andalas University, on this occasion, represented by the Vice Rector for Planning and Cooperation EVA. Our Honorable Keynote Speaker, today we have Prof. Hiroki Kue, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Pras Dizaini, Associate Professor Dr. Engineering Muhammad Maki, Professor Sajif Ratan Sarma, Dr. Wida Susanti Haji Suhaili, Associate Professor Indra Prabasari, PhD, and also uh, our Chairman and Chairwoman for a conference season, uh, Zuhud Rozaki, uh, PhD, and Associate Professor Dr. Samsiah Abdullah. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let us praise and thank the, the presence of Allah Almighty for the abundance of grace and joy of all that we could be gathering in this virtual conference with our Ran on Sustainable Agriculture and Biosystem 2021. This conference is annually uh, held by the Faculty of Agriculture. Uh, today is our fourth conference, which is uh, two conferences held in the COVID-19 pandemic condition. But nevertheless, this that we do our spirit to hold this event. We have considered that the issue of sustainable agriculture and the bio system to be very essential for the agriculture development as well as for the uh, country development uh, in agriculture. As we know, the global population is rising rapidly. Uh, World agriculture faces a critical challenge for producing and distributing sufficient food, feed and fiber to meet the uh, increasing demand in condition, uh, in climate changing and scare uh, of natural resources. Innovative policy and new farming approach based on strong scientific uh, need to tackle the challenge for the increasing agriculture production by also meeting environmental, economic, and social goal. In this conference, we expect that the key concept of sustainable agriculture in increasing agriculture productivity and efficiency, uh, promoting the sustainable use of natural resources without affecting the quality of soil and water, preserving the ecosystem, and protecting uh, animal welfare and also generating income for the farm which allow long time economic growth and enhancement of uh, production capacity along with uh, being uh, environmentally acceptable uh, will be delivered to respond to this problem except 2021 will play an important role and a strategic position uh, in mitigating the environmental, applying technology, social, and economic impact uh, for our country. Finally, I would like to thank very much to the Director of Andalas University, UITM, uh, keynote speaker, and all the participants for supporting this event. Also, to the organizing committee, we have spent their utmost effort to prepare and manage this event successful. Let me conclude my remarks by wishing our guests uh, happiness, good luck, and great success at the conference. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Thank you to Associate Professor Dr. Ferry Arlius for the welcoming address. It is now my deep pleasure to introduce the Rector of Andalas University, His Excellency Professor Dr. Julian Ri, representative by Associate Professor Dr. Hafrizal Handra, to deliver keynote speech and afterward we would like to request the Rector of Andalas University to officially open the International Conference on Sustainable Agriculture and Biosystem 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm applause. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning um, to all of you. Uh, first of all, we would like to say Alhamdulillah for uh, having this event, disyukur kepada Allah, uh, that we are here together for a very important moment, which is International Conference on Sustainability, Agriculture and Biosystem. Honorable invited speakers, uh, Dean of Faculty of Agriculture Technology, and the committee and all presenters, college, which are attending uh, this morning uh, in this conference. On behalf of the rector, it is a um, great pleasure for us to welcome you to the international to the international conference on sustainability agriculture and biosystem 2021 under the theme toward sustainable agriculture and biosystem in a pandemic this conference had been conducting had been conducted by the faculty since 2018 and regularly every year so it, it has been conducted four times from the beginning until today. Uh, we would like to, um, of course, explain that uh, Universitas Andalas is one of the oldest university in Indonesia, especially outside Java. So our university has been established since 1956. Uh, has been launched in on at September, at thirteen September, by Indonesia's founding fathers, Dr. Muhammad Hatta. Uh, 
So we hope that the next uh, conference can be conducted by physical um, meeting. As a con as a conference, um, this conference hopefully will share the knowledge, experience, and academics uh, between academics from various countries, as has been as explained by the committee that this conference has been attended by about more than 100 academics and professional. So we hope that through this conference, there will be an exchange of knowledge, exchange of experience, and also um, the collaboration, future collaboration between Universal Sandalas and all participants here could be uh, strengthened for the next years. Finally, on behalf of the rector, we are thanks to all participants and also to the committee, especially the, uh, the Faculty of Agriculture Technology as organizer and all uh, members of committee that has been working hard behind the scene. On behalf of the rector in the Sandalas, this morning we are formally open this international conference. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Thank you to Associate Professor Dr. Hafrizal Handra for the official opening ceremony for this event. Over the next program, we would like to present March of Andalas University. Before we come to next session, firstly, let us start this event by praying. So the event that we will hold on this day will run well without this, this session will be led by Adri Shahrun. To Adri Shahrun, the time is yours.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Ladies and gentlemen Let us bow our head for a moment Pray to God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So that our international conference Can be precious to all of us
Insinyur Ferry Arlius MSD, Dekan Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian Universitas Andalas Padang. Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian Universitas Andalas Padang lahir dari adanya tuntutan perkembangan zaman bagaimana penerapan teknologi di dalam bidang-bidang pertanian untuk mendapatkan hasil produksi yang lebih baik dan sesuai dengan kebutuhan masyarakat. Saat ini, Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian Universitas Andalas sudah berkembang menjadi satu fakultas baru yang mempunyai tiga jurusan yaitu teknik pertanian, teknologi hasil pertanian, dan teknologi industri pertanian. Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian Universitas Andalas bertekad untuk menjadi fakultas yang terkemuka di dalam pengembangan teknologi, terutama teknologi informasi yang berhubungan dengan Agriculture 4.0 yang tentu saja ke depan akan sangat dibutuhkan oleh masyarakat. Kami, Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian, sebagai salah satu wajah dari Universitas Andalas, selalu mengedepankan kualitas, penyesuaian, dan pengembangan program layanan untuk menciptakan generasi muda terbaik bangsa. Studi S1 Teknologi Hasil Pertanian telah berdiri sejak tahun 1967 sewaktu masih berada di bawah Fakultas Pertanian Universitas Andalas. Pada program studi S1 Teknik Hasil Pertanian, saat ini terdapat empat bidang peminatan. Teknologi dan rekayasa proses pangan atau hasil pertanian, kimia atau biokimia hasil pertanian dan kisi pangan, mikrobiologi dan bioteknologi pangan dan hasil pertanian, dan 
Total Quality Control dan Manajemen Industri Pertanian. Kami mempunyai misi menyelenggarakan pendidikan untuk pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan di bidang teknik pertanian dan biosistem, teknologi pangan dan pengolahan hasil pertanian, dan teknologi industri pertanian yang unggul untuk menghasilkan lulusan dengan kompetensi terbaik. Melaksanakan penelitian dasar dan terapan yang inovatif di bidang ilmu pengetahuan di bidang teknik pertanian dan biosistem, teknologi pangan dan pengolahan hasil pertanian, dan teknologi industri pertanian untuk mendukung pembangunan dan pengembangan IPTEK serta peningkatan perolehan haki dan publikasi ilmiah untuk kejayaan bangsa. Mendarma baktikan ilmu pengetahuan di bidang teknik pertanian dan biosistem, teknologi pangan dan pengolahan hasil pertanian, dan teknologi industri pertanian yang dikuasai untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat. Proses pengolahan agroindustri, teknik sistem dan manajemen agroindustri, dan teknologi lingkungan agroindustri. Tujuan kami menghasilkan sarjana yang menguasai pengetahuan dasar di bidang studi masing-masing dan dapat bersaing di tingkat nasional. Mengikuti perkembangan pengetahuan yang menyangkut disiplin ilmu masing-masing Mampu menerapkan pengetahuan dan teknologi dari masing-masing disiplin ilmu Dalam menjalankan peran dan fungsi untuk pembangunan Berkemauan dan mampu untuk bekerja efektif Serta memiliki kepekaan dan tanggap terhadap masalah yang dihadapi oleh masyarakat Tas teknologi pertanian yang kita sangat sangat untuk mendidik putra putri terbaik bangsa menjadi ahli ahli teknologi pertanian yang berwawasan lingkungan dan teknologi. Kita ingin lulusan kita menjadi pengusaha pengusaha di bidang pertanian, petani petani yang memanfaatkan ilmu dan teknologi untuk pengembangan pertanian. 
mudah-mudahan pembangunan petani Indonesia akan menjadi lebih maju teknologi pertanian. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before, before we come to the next program, we politely ask our participants to open your camera because we would like to capture some documentation. To keynote speakers, the dean, as well as participants and stakeholders are welcome to take position. For first stage, to screen one, please open your camera. To second screen, please. Third screen, please. To fourth screen. Fifth screen. To sixth screen. To seventh screen, please. To eighth screen, please. Thank you to all our participants, ladies and gentlemen. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Now we come to our main program, presentation, which will be presented by our speakers. This session will be led by our moderator, Honorable, Honorable Mr. Zuhur Ozaki, PhD. A little introduction about our moderator, Mr. Zuhur Rozaki, actively working with Department of Agribusiness Study, Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Yogyakarta. He's also 
had some formal education backgrounds, such as for bachelor degree, was graduated from Universitas Sebelas Maret, Surakarta in 2011. As well as finish his master degree from Jifu University and postgraduate from the same institutions. To Mr. Zuhur Ozaki, PhD, please, the time is all yours.
in Argentina. And uh, Indonesia imports a lot of about 75%. And also Indonesia produce mainly in dry season as a cover crop of rice. So uh, in a dry season, how to produce a soybean under the scared, under the limited water conditions more is very crucial issue, not only in Indonesia, but also in the world. So one of the way to cope with such as water scarcity is applying mulch normally, as we know very well. Uh, many types of mulches are applied in practical use and also for research works. For example, newspaper mulch was applied by um, some many researchers to maintain high soil, high soil water content. And uh, other than newspaper mulch and straw mulch and the other type of mulch are very uh, many times used. So the results showed that, uh, their results showed that uh, significantly higher plant height and yield of soybean by using straw mulch or newspaper mulch compared with no mulch. Other than such types of uh, mulches like such as paper and uh, straw, a uh, living mulch is many times applied. Uh, from the viewpoint of doing much, much functions, as I talk, plus achieving sustainable and organic agriculture to retain soil water and giving green manure. Um, the new researchers showed the result that uh, very similar yield wheat was uh, gotten by such a mulches compared with no mulch. But then sometimes a mulch application gave lower yield by the interference of growth by wheat, uh, growth on wheat by such a clover. So reviewing uh, many papers are still disadvantages or advantages of such a living mulch are now on the debatable condition. So nextly, uh, let me talk about objectives of the study. Uh, we tried to elucidate the effects of the two mulches. I mean, living mulch of white clover. From now on, let me show, uh, let me say CL or CL for clover mulch and the shred vapor mulch. First target is water consumption. That is uh, discussed by stomata conductance GS or soybean leaf and the bowel transpiration. Second one is the growth. Uh, discussed by photosynthesis P and chlorophyll fluorescence induction such as Electron, trans electron transport rate, ETR, and the known photochemical quenching NPQ. So from the viewpoint of the water consumption and growth, uh, I would like to show the effects of the two mulches under the different soil water conditions. We set the five different level of water, uh, soil water conditions. And in this uh, presentation, uh, let me show about the results and discussion from the flowering stage of the soybean to the pod forming stage. Next, uh, going on to the experimental details. As I shown, uh, two types of mulch is shown here, clover living mulch seal and shredded paper mulch under the five levels of soil water content, targeting around 20% of volumetric soil water content, 20 to 25, 
25 to 30%, 30 to 35%, and near saturated conditions. And let me show these five levels as SWC1 under the lowest and the driest condition, two, three, four, and five at the very near saturated, very high soil water content. Next, uh, let me show the experimental scenes in our experiment. Irrigating in the morning after measuring the weight of the pots for a bar transpiration, as I see the photos later, based on the five level of soil water content. And measuring SWC soil water content by this way for all pots here. This is an example for the measurement in the shredded paper mulch. And measuring uh, photosynthesis, stomata conductance, and uh, acrophil fluorescence induction processes by this way. Stomata conductance, GS, photosynthetic synthesis rate, and trans electron transport rate and non-photochemical quenching and PQ by this way. And measuring about transpiration by the change of the weight of the pot every morning. So about transpiration daily. And SWC as I shown already, and SPAD value of each targeted leaf by this way measuring spot value and weighing the weight of the pot or getting about transpiration by calculating the weight, change of the weight during So daily about transpiration was measured by this way for all pots. This is scenery for the measurement of P, G, S, E, T, L, and N, P, Q. It took about a one and a half hour for a set of measurement to get these for one single leaf of soybean. That's all for the measurement. But additionally, let me show about how the chlorophyll fluorescence induction processes were measured. By this way, measuring FM FS and FM prime, as I show later, ETL and NPQ were calculated. So let me move on to the results of the measurement. The first and the irrigation interval for each SWC level. These are the reality of the measurement. There's a table showing the in irrigation interval for CL and for SP under the different five soil water content level. Let me compare the irrigation interval between with clover mulch and shredded paper mulch. As I circled in red color here, so first thing we can see is that uh, uh, in irrigation interval and with the clover mulch was shorter than that than those under shredded paper mulch, as shown here. So this means that uh, uh, shorter irrigation interval means the larger about transpiration consumption under the clover mulch. So this is uh, due to the, not only the transpiration by the soybean, but also the clovers transpiration plus evaporation from the soil were represented in this the shorter irrigation interval with clover mulch. About the about transpiration, I will show later. 
Next thing is the reality of the flat height and LAI measurement. First, uh, under the CSP, shredded paper mulch, plant height and LAI were higher in the SWC level from two to four. This meant that uh, soybean could grow better under the very moderate to the relatively high soil water content. While the soil uh, soybean could not grow very well under very dry condition and, the and also under the very wet condition, the soybean could grow very well. Um, plant height, if we compare with CL and SP, plant height shown here was significantly higher at all SLC levels in shredded paper mulch compared with that in the clover mulch. In clover mulch, under the SLC level four, this is a quite a wet condition, show the highest plant height. But for LAI, no clear difference between the four level except for the SWC1. Next, uh, let me talk about measure the about transpiration. These are also the reality of the measurement. Uh, first, comparison between comparison of about transpiration between clover mulch and the shred of paper, shredded paper mulch show that uh, a significantly higher about transpiration with CL than those with SP. So these results correspond to the short irrigation interval that I sh already shown in the table one. If we focus on the ET with the clover mulch, we can't show, uh, we can't get a clear no clear differences of about transpiration at HSWC, except under the driest condition like this. And this may be caused by the reactive transpiration by clover, and even under quite dry condition. Because and thoughtfully, uh, clover could extend its root to the very deep layer, soil layer. So the clover's uh, root could extract soil moisture even under the quite dry condition, we guess. Uh, focusing on the about transpiration with a shredded paper mulch, as we can see, higher about transpiration was gotten under the higher soil. and NPQ, as written here. Uh, photosynthesis and stomata conductance was parameterized by a non-rectangular high, high public function shown here. Secondly, electric, electric non-transport rate was calculated by this equation by the measurement of these three parameters. Then, the calculated ETR was parameterized by this equation. Third is NPQ. Uh, NPQ is uh, interpreted as thermal dissipation processes that acts to regulate and to protect photosynthesis. 
under especially the high light conditions. At light energy absorption in the photochemical system second exceeds the capacity of light utilization. Against such a condition, and, and plants have a function of NPQ to regulate and to protect photosynthesis. NPQ was calculated by this equation by using the measure of these three parameters. And nextly, NPQ was parameterized by this equation. First, let me show about the stomata conductance and the electric transport rate of the soybean with the shredded paper mulch. Uh, these were the relationship between PPFD. PPFD is a photosynthetic photon flux density, the relationship between PPFD and these three. Under the different soil water content, wettest condition five and the driest condition one. Uh, if we compare then these uh, parameters between the wet and dry condition, all were uh, very low compared with in a uh, very low in a dry condition compared with the wet condition. So the lower transpiration at the SWC that was gotten from the lower GS. This means that the stomata closed due to the water stress in the condition of SWC1. Next was the similar uh, comparison, but with the clover mulch. With the clover mulch also, then under the driest condition, the stomato conductance was lower than the other SWC conditions. This also showed that the stomata of the soybean closed under the driest condition due to water stress. Next, let me compare those between SP and CL. I'm sorry, Prof, five minutes left. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let me skip. Okay, let me show the summary, a part of the summary of this um, research. Uh, we could get a uh, lower electron transport rate in the um, lower soil water content. And also we could get a lower ETR under the CL compared with SP. That might be caused by the uh, water stress that uh, by caused by the clover. I mean, that soybean competed with so uh, competed for water with clover. If the clover well, was used for mulch, yeah. also it was shown in the NPQ. The lower NPQ under the driest condition, the NPQ function was uh, influenced by the. Uh, water stress and the nutrient process that um, nutrient nu nutrient um, stress caused by the clover. From this result, uh, clover is not an appropriate uh, materials for um, mulch because um, it will cause the water stress and the nutrient stress on, on soybean production. ETL and NPQ was all were also uh, caused um, were influenced by the clover mulch compared with shredded paper mulch. It was lower in the CL condition 
compared with ASP because and water stress and nutrient stress influence on the soybean. Okay, lastly, let me uh, summarize here. Uh, gross of soybean. Firstly, ETL. As I said, ETLs were lower in CL than with a shredded paper mulch because of water stress and the nutrient nutrient stress caused by the clover influence on the um, ETL of the soy and soybean. And the PQ also showed such an, uh, properties. Under the dry condition, also it was as it, um, very low. I mean, uh, thermal dissipation processes was very small under the condition of the uh, clover mulch compared with that with the shredded paper mulch. Those um, results uh, shown by the ETL and NPQ was representing lastly photosynthesis rate. Photosynthesis rate P was lower in the, in the clover mulch compared with that is the shredded pepper mulch. That was caused by the lower GS and ETL, having a water stress and nutrient stress. So that showed a significantly higher plant height and the LAI of soybean in the shredded paper mulch compared with the clover mulch. So this uh, result showed that uh, shredded paper mulch could function very well to save water consumption as about transpiration and also supported production of soybean. On the other hand, Clover mulch could not function very well because in clover interfered uh, the growth and uh, growth and growth of soybean in terms of the water stress and nutrient stress. Also, the clover well, transpiration by the transpiration of the clover. Thank you very much for your giving my presentation. That's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for, pro for Professor uh, Hiroki Oe uh, for the amazing presentation, excellent presentation. Actually, for the mousing practice to uh, control the water in the soil already practiced in Indonesia, but usually farmers are using the plastic mousing but uh, professor using the shredded papers actually it's uh, very interesting and maybe the farmers in Indonesia can try to use that because maybe the price is uh, will be cheaper than the plastic mousing but actually it will be uh, really interesting to be discussed in the discussion so I hope that the participants in this conference can prepare the question and then raise uh, the, your hand when you want to ask the question in the discussion session. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, could you unshare your screen, Prof? Okay. Uh, there is the, that is the first speaker that we have already heard. Let's continue to the next speaker. Please committee to share the curriculum vitae of the second speaker. Yes, the second speaker will be Associate Professor Dr. Moh Rasti Zaini. He is uh, from the University Technology Mara. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there is unfortunate and fortunate.
the title from uh, Dr. Moh Rasti Zaini is the Food and Agriculture Sector Challenges and Opportunities in COVID-19 Pandemic. Please committee to play back the video. Presenters, distinguished international and local participants, guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for me to deliver my speech representing the University of Technology Mara at this very important conference. I would like to take this, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Faculty of Agriculture Technology, Universitas Andalas. Padang, Indonesia, especially the organizing committee of International Conference on Sustainable Agriculture and Biosystem 2021 for the excellent arrangement for this conference and their assistance. Thank you very much for inviting me to share my insight. The pandemic has changed our lifestyle and has caused social disruption. Therefore, today, we have no choice than to meet virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic had a dramatic impact on the food system with direct and indirect consequences on lives and livelihoods of peoples, plants and animals around the globe. Given the complexity of the system at risk, it is likely that some of these consequences are still to emerge over time. With every crisis comes not only challenges, but also an opportunity to accelerate transformations in the food and agriculture sectors to be more resilient. Therefore, necessary actions such as investment in technology that contribute to the sustainable flow of agriculture productions along the supply chain to prevent food crisis especially during the pandemic, is so crucial. This is to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the food system, which I will discuss further in my presentation entitled Food and Agriculture Sector, Challenges and Opportunities in COVID-19 Pandemic. Next slide, please. The different pandemics that humanity has experienced, such as SARS, Ebola, and swine flu, have had a great impact on the economy, the environment, and any human activity, such as agriculture, tourism, transport, education, health, mining, industry, commerce, and many more. Currently, Humanity is facing another pandemic, the infection of the new coronavirus, which generates the disease that is now known as COVID-19. In year 2019, the first case of infection of a new coronavirus was reported in Wuhan, China. Since that time, the report of globally confirmed cases of infection with this virus has had an alarming growth, now being the main global health problems, which is affecting the normal development of society and, is, and all its components. In Malaysia, the first case of COVID-19 detected on 25th uh, January 2020. And recently, we was in the third phase of movement control order due to the risk of cases. Alhamdulillah, 
the MCO 3.0 has ended early November and now more sectors are open. I think from past pandemic experience, it has been shown that the quarantines and panic have an impact on human activities in agriculture sectors. When there is an outbreak of infectious disease, there is also an increase in hunger and malnutrition. The situation worsened as the disease progressed, making movement restriction more and more stringent, causing labor shortage for the harvest or difficulties for farmers to bring their products to markets. The effect on agriculture has influenced the food and agriculture sectors dramatically, caused direct and indirect consequences, especially on its supply chains, including restriction agriculture workers, planting current and future harvests, which largely impacting the food availability, demand and food safety. The crisis has threatening the food security of millions of people around the world who is already suffering from hunger and malnutrition before the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is a global health crisis that is already having devastating impacts on the world economy, both directly and through necessary measures to contain the spread of the disease. This impact are also being felt by Malaysia in the food and agriculture sectors. Based on the report available in the MIDA website, or we call it Malaysian Investment Development Authority, the agriculture and services sectors recorded a higher percentage of job loss compared to other sectors, while the supply of food has held up well to date in many countries. The measures put in place to contain the spread of the virus are starting to disrupt the supply of agri-food products to markets and consumers, both within and across borders. The sector is also experiencing a substantial shift in the composition and for more some commodities, the level of demand. So this slide, we can see that how damaging this impact turned out to be uh, will depend in large part on policy response over the short, medium, and long term. Actually, this impact uh, turned out to be for food security, nutrition, and livelihood of farmers, fishers, and other working along the food supply chain would depend in large part on policy responses over the short, medium, and long term. In the short term, government must manage multiple demands. Ref responding to the health uh, crisis, managing the consequences of the shock to the economy, and ensuring the smooth functioning of the food system. While the pandemic poses some serious challenges for the food system in the short term, it is also an opportunity to accelerate transformation in the food and agriculture sectors to build its resilience in the face of a range of challenges. The Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO 2020, states that COVID-2019 is affecting agriculture in two significant aspects. The first supply and the secondly is demand for food. These two aspects are directly related to food security. So food security is also at risk. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned, the degree of impact demand on the severity of the ep epidemic in the regions, as well as the level measures taken by the government to handle the crisis. The impact hit the hardest on the poorest and most vulnerable groups. In general, there are two channels of impact, supply side and of course another uh, demand side. 
look at for this look at to this slide disturbance on consumption of agri food products on the demand side the population suffer from loss of income and unable to afford food for their daily needs these vulnerable groups are the most at risk the situation has amplified by possible increase in the price of food while the other country, country level food importer country pose greater risk due to the cost increase while on the supply side there was shock on production factors such as closure of factory producing fertilizer for example cost low availability and high price of the agriculture inputs due to the lower yield or decrease supply ladies and gentlemen how do we relate the situation with food security from definition food security exists when all people at all time have physical and economic access to sufficient safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for active and healthy life uh, with the with the recent uh, covid-19 pandemic it cannot be denied that the coronavirus has underscored the importance of food security the guaranteed access to a sufficient quantity of affordable safe and nutritious food while the immediate crisis may be under the control is not the end of the story how secure is food in, in malaysia and should we be worried about food security especially during the pandemic as per highlighted the lack of research and development lack of young talent in the agriculture industry and dependency on other countries for food supply as issues to be addressed uh, in order to ensure the country's preparedness for future crises how are going to fix this in light of the current situation we should concentrate on resolving factors that have caused lagging in the food sectors at the forefront to excel in the food security uh, we have to be in the condition where all citizens have physical social and economic access to an adequate safe and nourishing food and fiber support in other words we need to lead a healthy lifestyle we need to relook at the various factors of food security to ensure we address them holistically we cannot just look at only demand and supply sides uh, where food is supply and is produced domestically but other factors such as farm level determinants uh, including efficiency and productivity of farmers and smallholders land and input constraints policy and trade factors as well as environmental factors should be addressed smallholder farming system uh, i think uh, often less resilient to shock and have fewer support structures in place to decrease the impact and increase the rate of recovery due to shock as compared to the commercial farm uh, such shock as covid-19 will likely lead to disruption on both the demand side due to loss of income from workers reduction in tourism and restaurant activity as well as the supply side due to production related issues such as disruptions to input supply level availability and food losses and food wastage due to lack of storage facilities and a slow shift in transportation additionally the impact of covid-19 on agriculture will be felt on both the physical aspect uh, sorry uh, i think on the both bio Uh, biophysical aspects such as production and access to input as well as socio-economic aspect such as access to labor markets 
or rapid shift in demand. Okay, for this slide, as far as we concern, enough food is available globally, but COVID-19 is disrupting supply and demand in complex ways. Many countries have designated the agriculture and agro-food sectors as essential and exempt from business closure and restriction on movement. For these countries, the direct impact of the pandemic on primary agriculture should be limited as the disease does not affect the natural resources upon which production is based. However, the virus poses a serious threat to food security and livelihood in the poorest countries where agriculture production systems are more labor intensive and there is less capacity to withstand a severe macroeconomic shock. Because food is a basic necessity, the level of food demand should be affected less by the crisis than the demand for other goods and services. I think there has been a major shift in the structure of demand. Uh, with a collapse in demand from restaurants, hotels and catering, the closure in demand from uh, the closure of open markets and a surge in demand from supermarkets. There are signs that business along the food chain are already adapting to shift in demand. For example, by switching production lines and increasing their capacity to manage larger inventories, moving to online platform and direct delivery to household and hiring temporary staff. How, uh, how are these disruption being uh, manifested across the food system? The limits on the mobility of people across uh, borders and lockdowns are contributing to labor shortage for agriculture sectors in many countries, particularly those char characterized by periods of peak seasonal labor demand or labor-intensive production. Harvesting season is imminent for many products in the Northern Hemisphere, and a shortage of labor could lead to production losses and shortages, sorry, and shortage in the market. In many countries, this comes on top of existing difficulties in sourcing seasonal labor. On the other hand, disruption downstream from the farm gate are in some cases causing surplus to accumulate, putting a strain on storage facilities and for highly perishables, increasing food losses. For some product, supply side disruption are being compounded by demand side reduction. In uh, particularly food uh, that typically eaten away from home and luxury item, uh, in, uh, in combination, this effect are putting a strain on farm incomes. Moreover, those farm household income loss may be compounded by reduce of farm income. The COVID-19 pandemic may also affect the availability of key intermediate input for farmers. For the moment, there do not seem to be shortage in producing regions of developed countries. Although farmers may face extra difficulties in sourcing input due to additional restriction on the movement of people and goods. However, in some regions, the production of pesticides declined sharply and only resumed gradually after production plants were shut down following the outbreaks. Low availability and high prices of inputs, such as pesticide, could weight on yields and crop production, particularly in developing countries. Closing border or slowing down the transboundary movement of seed could potentially hamper seed supply chains and on-time delivery of seeds, with negative impact on agriculture. 
feed and food production over the next season and further into the future. Next slide. Disruption to food supply chain. I think there is a need to meet social distancing requirements. For example, in packing and grading fruits and vegetables and in processing livestock products. In addition to absenteeism, is increasing cost and reducing production capacity, even as consumer demand in supermarket increase. The available workforce has also been reduced due to rising infection rates and absenteeism, and in response to lockdown, even in critical sectors. In addition to disrupting supply, infection in processing facilities have in turn led to reduction in demand at the farm level. Lockdown and limit on the mobility of people are also affecting the provision of key food safety, quality and certification checks, including those that are required to facilitate trade, such as physical inspection of goods to certify compliance with sanitary requirements. So what are the way forward? What are the ways that we could do to enhance food security to face the pandemic? At this stage, some policy response that can be considered in developing a comprehensive food security strategy framework, including enhancing innovation and research development, educating growers and good management, supply and demand, post-harvest handling, as well as collaborative effort between university, industry, and NGOs. More importantly, who will be the driver for all this planning and development in the near future? The answer is our young generation. Increased R&D and high-tech and modern facilities will attract more young generation to the agriculture sectors by modernizing it and making it more user-friendly. If we can have farmers that work with technology, like computers and smartphones, we can modernize our agriculture sector and this transformation is required in order to get young people into farming and become agropreneurs and job creators. I think nowadays, uh, technology is changing the world and farming is catching up. The introduction of everything from automated farm equipment to wide array of Internet of Things sensors that measure soil moisture, for example, and drones that keep track of crops have changed the business of agriculture. Some experts even call this movement as Agriculture 4.0. A digital farm is more efficient and sustainable than its counterpart of the past. On a smart digital farm, crops are likely grown using precision agriculture. Tractors might be self-driving. The harvest could be determined by digital imaginary of the fields. And the farmers is typically working with an agronomist to provide technology know-how. Therefore, greater innovation, research and planning should be emphasized in all aspects while embracing IR 4.0. While the use of internet and remote access for environmental and greenhouse gases monitoring, especially software to control and integrate all parameters or variables, such as temperature, moisture, rainfall, and etc. Use of artificial intelligence and big data for smart farming can elevate the agriculture sectors and food security. I think we almost uh, to the end of our uh, session. Uh, to recap, agriculture is one of the most important sectors in human development and is related to food security. Hence, 
both agriculture and food security have a very strong relationship and this relationship is being affected by events related to the disease of COVID-19. The pandemic has a great impact on the action and activities of humanity in agriculture and thus food security are greatly affected due to mobility restriction, reduced purchasing power and with a greater impact on the most vulnerable population groups. As cases of contagion increase, governments take more drastic measures to stop the spread of the virus, also influencing the global food system. The premise of any measure adopted should be to protect the health and food security of the population. To the detriment of economic growth, although some governments go in the opposite direction. As I mentioned earlier, with every crisis comes not only challenges, but also an opportunity to accelerate transformation in the food and agriculture sectors to be more resi resilient. It is up to us to plan and execute necessary action that contributes to the sustainable flow of agriculture production along the supply chain to prevent food crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 pandemic has not ended yet until there is an effective vaccine of treatments. Everyone remains at risk. We all need to work together to protect ourselves and others and the things that we can do, uh, such as uh, avoid the trees, the three C's, continue to proactive uh, continue to practice protective measures, continue to protect ourselves and others, and remember always wash your hands. With that note, I end my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I hope that the seminar will be a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mo Rasdi, for the great presentation regarding the challenges and opportunities uh, for the agriculture sector during the pandemic and post pandemic. And I do agree for all what the Dr. Mohrasti explained uh, that the pandemic or the COVID-19 impact to the agriculture sector quite hard, especially if we talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, first impact come to the health crisis and then go to the economic crisis. And fortunately, it doesn't go to the security, security crisis. If go to the security crisis, it will be chaos and then a uh, big problem will impact, uh, will uh, come to our life. So uh, fortunately, it doesn't go to the security crisis, only stop in the economic crisis, but Actually, uh, all people or sector try to regain the condition, try to uh, solve the problem that uh, come from the pandemic. Okay, thank you very much again for the Dr. Moh Rasti. And then I want to remind to the all participants, please prepare your question. Uh, except for Dr. Rasti, yeah, because Dr. Rasti cannot uh, attend this conference due to today is the... Uh, University Technology Mara Rector inauguration, so he cannot uh, attend this conference. Okay, please commit open or share the third speaker. The third speaker, the Associate Professor Doctor Engineering Muhammad Maki from Andalas University Indonesia with the title Trend in Non-Destructive Quality Inspection for Oil Palm Fresh Fruits Buns in Indonesia. So he graduated uh, his PhD from Agricultural System and Engineering at the ASEAN Institute of Technology or AIT in Thailand. Hello, Dr. Maki. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning, doctor. Yes. Welcome to the International Conference on Sustainable Agriculture and Biosystem. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Unfortunately, okay. I cannot start my my camera for this uh, session. Yeah, that's okay. Please start okay, your presentation. But, uh, I can share yeah. my presentation directly from my laptops. Yes, okay, okay. 
please your time is 25 minutes yeah. doctor thank you very much uh, mr zulut arozaki for this opportunity so ladies and gentlemen esteemed speaker our respected dean as well as all our participants in this conference i would like to present our trend in non-destructive quality inspection for oil pump fresh fruit pumps in indonesia uh, due to the certain uh, agreement in this research uh, uh, i kindly ask the committee to post the uh, to post the recording uh, until the presentation is over is it possible Hello, committee. Maybe it is unpublished material, yeah? Yes. Hello, committee. Can you, or maybe it is still recorded, but the committee will cut the part, your part. It is also. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. So, some of this uh, technology development is, under, uh, is still under uh, final phase. And right now, I am in the middle of the oil pump plantation to test the device uh, directly for uh, further uh, application in uh, large scale. This technology comprises of several advancements in non-destructive sensing, which will be used in the near future in mass quantity due to the COVID-19 pandemic situation, which immediately uh, influenced the availability of manpower, as well as the logistic condition worldwide that affect the global um, marketing of oil pump. Okay, can you see the video? Yes, Doc. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, several technology that we have been developed with the co cooperation with several uh, oil pump companies includes the utilization of unmanned aerial vehicle, where certain tasks is impossible to be conducted by the manpower or the labor by manual tasks. So. Some utilization will include uh, innovation in technology, innovation in using the technology itself, as well as innovation in the uh, flow process in the industrial sector. Certain areas such as application of fertilization and application of pesticides, as well as herbicides, have been successfully conducted in a certain area, in certain uh, demonstration plot inside the uh, commercial plantation, commercial plantation itself. We have calculated that if we compare to manual labor, first, the task can be uh, finished or can be performed with much shorter time, and, and when we also calculated in in terms of uh, economical aspect, we also uh, have uh, calculated the benefit of this technology, where using this uh, unmanned, unmanned aerial vehicle uh, instruments, we could perform the similar tasks in 15 minutes, Whereas when we use a manual labor application, it will require around two to three hours. So we have uh, improved the uh, we have improved the efficiency in the field application as much as one sixth or uh, six times the productivity of the current situation. Moreover, uh, some pesticide application cannot immediately be uh, conducted by uh, labor themselves. Why? Because 
the location of the application is in the upper in the upper surface of the plants itself whereas the plants can reach a height of 12 up to 18 meters and therefore it is out of reach of uh, the labor and thus mechanization is required however due to the certain condition in the field uh, mechanization cannot fully adopted in the plantation first due, due to the topographical uh, factor secondly due to the soil condition and church due to the uh, area that are not permissible for uh, mechanical uh, units to be uh, running on that location so by utilizing by utilizing uh, aerial application first uh, restriction in the trajectory of the application can be uh, limited or can be uh, nullified and secondly we can produce more accurate uh, application or more accurate uh, uh, point of dropping or point of applying the chemicals without spreading it all over non-essential area and therefore it will be more safe to the environment it will reduce the total of uh, chemical application in field and of course it will transfer uh, automatically to the reduction of the total production costs the other benefit is the limit, limiting or reduction of uh, green, green uh, GHG gas, greenhouse gas emission, because first, uh, the total of chemical applying is reduced. Secondly, uh, secondly, no other area uh, affected by the chemical because only a uh, small uh, or localized uh, concentration of uh, herbicide will be applied uh, with high accuracy and therefore only those area uh, which affected by uh, pests or other, other non uh, plants that will be eliminated and therefore for example if we compare the application through mechanization which cover 100% of total uh, plantation area uh, selective or far varying uh, doses of chemical application can reduce the the use of chemical up to 60% and hence, we reduce the pressure of the soil themselves, as well as the microorganism that grow and develop inside the soil. And uh, of course, uh, it will also correlate to the requirement of fertilizer to promote the growth of the plant itself. So not only it is safer, it is also will reduce uh, the requirement of chemical uh, further chemical apl application in the form of fertilizer. And we also understand that some uh, technology can be used to supplement or at least add or uh, complement the requirement or the labor intensive application in the plantation itself. And therefore, we can uh, reduce the manpower, which every year is getting uh, 
is very more challenging for the plantation to fulfill the uh, expert the to fulfill the skillful labor to perform the task that cannot be processed by uh, interns as well as cannot be uh, performed by uh, non uh, by non-expert labor or labor who have limited uh, experience. And therefore, by utili utilizing the technology, we can complement the whole process in the oil pump plantation for uh, first, reduction in waste, second, improving the efficiency, the total efficiency of the plantation, uh, uh, the plantation uh, uh, business, and third, to improve, uh, third to improve the competitiveness of the company who adopt the technology. Why? Because by adopting the technology, the company itself can reduce the mine or the total cost for product, product producing the is the oil on hands. Uh, it will also promote the more uh, utilization of these products in form of uh, fractionation or further process of uh, crude oil pump into more beneficial products and uh, product that have a higher uh, strategical uh, aspect or product that have more value as compared to the uh, current uh, main product which is in the form of crude oil. So some technology can be used using simple tools while other technology uh, will require more advanced uh, or more complex uh, components that may or may not necessarily available in our country. Therefore, it can uh, promote transactional technology, uh, not only within uh, national scope, but also international scope. Thus, uh, it will promote the promotion of more safe or more green technology application in the oil pump industry. So we can uh, understand that uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, only certain agro-industrial sector can uh, supplement or can uh, negate it the deficit in uh, Indonesian uh, economy in terms of uh, import and exports uh, balance. Uh, therefore, uh, the agro-industrial sector will be uh, placed by the government to promote their strategical aspect as well as the benefit that immediately and directly received by small farm holder, such as the oil pump holders, as well as uh, improving the income of the country itself by uh, tax revenue or by some scam. Certain amount of export fees to a financial endowment agency or BPDKS. In turn, this agency will return the investment by the company in uh, funding for research, funding for uh, improving the seeds, funding for improving the flow process of uh, uh, for flow process of production as well as uh, funding for uh, improving or replenishing the old trees into a, a replanting program. Um, 
Moreover, uh, moreover, some technology can also be used small farmer. Why? Because uh, this technology uh, may not necessarily uh, too expensive to be utilized with the occupation of certain plantation area. For example, a cooperation of a farmer cooperation in, in uh, have around uh, 1200 hectares of plantation and then they can spare the revenue uh, to implement the technology that promotes the quality uh, that promotes the quality of the products and therefore in return they will receive more revenue by selling primer products prime products uh, and receive uh, the benefits of selling the product with higher quality. So, a certain simple technology such as multi multiband sensing can be utilized can be utilized to be used uh, in small uh, uh, crop production such as paddy fields such as uh, uh, cornfield or other uh, crops to uh, support the agricultural systems in Indonesia and to produce healthy food or green foods that will uh, reduce the effect of stunting in our younger generation. And this technology is already available and can be utilized uh, by academician in several university. We only need a bridge to reach the farmer or to reach the food product producer uh, actor to utilize the technology, implement it, and then they will uh, receive the benefits and by this benefit, they will also promote to others uh, through their testimony that by using a technology produced by Andalus University, for example, I gain more uh, value of my products by certain percentage. And this technology is not... Uh, is not always expensive. So by, by times, the technology cost will be reduced. The availability will be in more, uh, in more quantity and reachable or uh, can be obtained even through marketplace. This is not, not uh, this is not a, uh, sophisticated technology, but simple technology can be utilized to improve the value of the agricultural products. And therefore, it will promote the livelihood of our farmer, and hence, it will support the sustainable development goal, uh, one, to reduce uh, poverty, and two, to reduce or to alleviate them. Moreover, some ways can be turned into a certain simple technology can be uh, that can be uh, utilized by the small uh, small scale farmer, and then they can uh, produce uh, their own uh, byproducts, and then these byproducts can be sold to add their income. For example, uh, some farmers in uh, West Pasaman area uh, produce bio charcoal and by uh, uh, adoption of nano uh, charcoal technology from Andalus University, they can uh, produce traditional red palm oil that have 
low concentration of free fatty acid as well as uh, MCPD. We understand that MCPD by the European standards uh, at certain level, uh, 0.5 will produce uh, health risks for prolonged consumption. But by utilizing of the byproducts of their oil plantation themselves, they can uh, produce this traditional oil with several level of concentration of MCD. Sorry, Doc, I think that will conclude my oh, okay. uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I return the time to the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Maki, for the great presentation regarding the technology for uh, identifying the stage of the palm in Indonesia, palm uh, fruits, but actually in Indonesia, the palm trees plantation uh, quite huge, uh, become one of the biggest in Indonesia. And this research actually will contribute more for the development of palm trees. Uh, and in the recent days, I I saw that uh, the oil uh, oil price is uh, quite increasing. So maybe uh, we as the agriculture practitioner or maybe academician can contribute to that issue too. Yeah. Okay. Let's move to the discussion. Hello, Professor Hiroki Owe. Are you still there? We will do the live discussion with the participants. Okay, okay, still there. Okay, thank you, Prof. And Dr. Maki, uh, we will do the live uh, discussion. Okay, please uh, raise your hand and then state your question, but please be effective in stating your question, yeah? Please don't too long. And then to who your question for? Okay, the first uh, the first question come from uh, Miss Aninda Tiffany Puari. Please, Miss Aninda. Thank you, Mr. Zuhud, for the opportunity. I would like to ask the questions to Mr. Hiroki. Good morning, Mr. Hiroki. Uh, it was a nice presentation. Uh, however, from your uh, interesting research, actually, I want... Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, I can also listen to your voice. Okay. Uh, so the question for Mr. Hiroki was, uh, from his research, uh, I was curious whether the methods applied affected the water quality of the agricultural product uh, that has uh, 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 that has uh, affected, by, that has, has been uh, under the research method for the uh, system. That's all. <laughs> Is it clear, uh, Sensei? Sorry, I could not hear um, due to an echo and uh, howling. Uh, please, let, please tell again, very yes. simply. Yes, Miss Aninda, please simply. Uh, so the question was, uh, uh, I was curious whether the method that you applied has affected the water quality of the agricultural products. toward the water quality of the agricultural products. Yeah, yeah. The, the products of the agricultural system that he was doing in their research. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and applying an amount is one of the ways to reduce um, water transpiration, meaning uh, water consumption and uh, uh, produce more an yield of soybean. So based on our results, uh, applying a very natural materials like uh, uh, shredded paper is one of the good ways to reduce water consumption. And uh, after that, it will make a larger water use efficiency. So,
materials such as an uh, plastic mulch. Uh, but um, we hoped before studying this uh, this research, uh, actually speaking, we hoped that uh, living mulch such as an clover will also help the soybean production and uh, save water. But unfortunately, if the clover would be planted with soybean, the clover inhibited the growth of soybean. So one of the countermeasures for, for using the clover as a mulch, maybe is that uh, um, planting clover first, and after that, then sowing the soybean so that the soybean can grow under a very senescent clover uh, with which a uh, soil surface will be covered and the uh, nutrition that was left by the clover can be uh, applied by the soybean. So this is a um, very simple idea for producing soybean in larger yield and uh, by saving water. Does it make an answer for your question, please? Hello, Miss Aninda. Is it clear the answer from Prof. Hiroki Owe? Yes, uh, but uh, actually also I want to clarify that whether, let's say that uh, we applied this method to the for growing the soybean, but at the end, uh, the soybean produce has a different water quality than of the soybean itself has different between this method than the usual method that has been applied normally. I see. Thank you for mm -hmm. your comments. And as we did not touch on the water quality, Uh, okay, let's move to the next uh, question come from Mr. Guyuk Mahardian, Dwi Putra. Please, Mr. To who the question for? Please unmute your mic first. Okay. <laughs> well, good morning, Prof. Hiroki. Uh, I would like to ask to Prof. Hiroki. Hello. Yes. But Hello. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Please slowly, okay. yeah, doc. Uh, doc, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, uh, Prof. Rocky, can you explain again about irrigation interval with between uh, mulsa type, uh, white clover, and shredded pepper mulch? There is a different inter irrigation interval. Can you uh, explain again why a different irrig uh, irrigation interval for uh, two mulch types? That's okay, please, Prof. Okay. Can you catch uh, the question, Prof? Thanks for a very important question. Yes. Uh, as you said, and as you uh, look at um, the, my presentation, the irrigation interval was different between the two uh, mulch conditions. And clover mulch uh, produced um, a larger uh, times irrigation. So um, irrigation interval was very small in the clover mulch than that in the soy and, show and shredded paper mulch. Uh, that uh, was caused by the larger evapotranspiration loss with the clover mulch due to uh, not only 
not only transpiration by soybean, but also uh, as transpiration, less soil surface evaporation. Uh, with a shredded paper mulch, uh, soil surface evaporation was saved uh, by the shredded paper cover covering the soil surface. So um, shorter irrigation interval in the clover mulch was caused by my mainly by the transpiration by clover. Uh, before that, and I should have explained about an experimental setting. Irrigation timing was decided to keep the targeted soil water conditions. By measuring soil water content every morning, then if the soil water content of that pot was below the target, we irrigated. So for example, to keep the soil water content the condition of the pot was below 35%. So uh, irrigation interval represented the frequency of irrigation to keep the targeted soil water content. So that was as shown in the irrigation interval and differences between SL, I mean shredded paper mulch and clover mulch. Is this for your uh, question? Okay. Is it, it is enough, Doc? Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Hirogi Owe and the uh, question. And then let's move to the next question. Is there any participants who want to ask? Now already two uh, participants who ask, but uh, all go to the Prof. Hiroki Owe. Hello, participants. We do have 140, yeah? more than 140 participants who participated in this uh, joint meeting. Okay, maybe meanwhile, we are waiting the participant to ask. Maybe the question come from me for uh, Dr. Maki. I know that uh, your instrument to uh, measure the quality of the fruits uh, in the non-destructive way still in prototype. But do you think that your instrument or your uh, machine, it is economically uh, applicable for the future, doc, Dr. Maki? Hello, Dr. Maki? Uh, your mic still mute, Doc. Hello, Dr. Maki. Hello, are you still there, Doc? Yes, hello. Hello. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, I, I have uh, issues with my internet connection. Can you, yes. uh, can you readdress the question? Yes. Uh, I know that your instrument to uh, measure the quality of the fruits uh, you think that in the future it is uh, economically viable or economically applicable uh, for the industry, palm trees industry, doc. It, uh, one uh, private company in East Kalimantan to uh, upscale the prototypes in quantity and uh, perhaps in the near future they will adopt uh, this technology uh, because they have the plans to improve uh, their uh, sustainability as well as to improve their uh, efficiency in cost production uh, due to the shortage of manpower, due to the uh, global warming condition, and due to the uh, current uh, distribution in uh, current uh, inter conflict interest in logistic, uh, therefore they will need to, pro to produce faster, better, and more efficient. Thank you very much.
I think your microphone is still muted. Yeah, thank you, Doc. If we compare between the destructive method and non-destructive method, like you are applying, actually, how far your uh, non-destructive method contribute to the quality of the uh, palm products, Doc? Hello, Doc. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. yes. Uh, at the current moment, we cannot measure immediately because we're still in the phase of uh, upscaling our uh, uh, research products. So this is not in a uh, commercial stage yet. So this is still the second phase of uh, research where we have established the proof of concept. We have produced the prototype and we are in the initial stage of uh, production of pre-commercial products and in research we understand that uh, this technology uh, have better performance uh, with uh, current uh, assessment methods which uh, one fruit uh, will require so, uh, sorry, three day of uh, analysis and require around uh, 10 manpower. So the cost of fruit evaluation with traditional chemical analysis uh, will be very costly. But with these products, the fruits can be assessed instantly in less than one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good idea, Doc. I hope the prototype upscale uh, process can be uh, going well, yeah, Doc, yeah? Okay. Is there any other question from the participants? Actually, uh, the, this first plenary session is very interesting uh, topics that I, uh, participants can discuss, yeah? Is there any question from the participants? Okay, uh, meanwhile, we are waiting the participants to ask uh, to the speaker, maybe the question come from me. Uh, Professor Hiroki Owe, I want to ask about the paper, uh, shredder, shred paper mousing uh, practice. So which is more effective on mousing practice uh, in the paper, uh, shred paper mousing practice in subtropical area such as in Japan or in tropical area in such as in Indonesia, Dr. Uh, Prof. With the uh, shred paper mousing uh, technology, Prof. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, from the viewpoint of the mechanism of uh, saving evaporation loss from the soil surface by the shredded paper, uh, the area or region is not be the problem. Uh, but one of the issues is whether the climatic condition is dry or wet. Mm -hmm. So um, under the wet condition, Maybe to uh, save and soil source evaporation is not a uh, primary issue, but under the dry condition, I have ever visited Indonesia many times, many many times, and I have had many experiences in a dry condition. It is very very quite dry. So and in that condition, I hope that the shredded paper much will have a very big power to save a soil source evaporation loss. So I would like to uh, test the effectiveness of the shredded paper as you questioned in your country. Thank you very much. Yeah, Doc. So, uh, Prof, uh, actually uh, for the continue to, for this discussion, I would like to ask, so uh, how if we apply the shredded paper mousing uh, for the irrigation method, which is the better, Prof? for the drip irrigation for inside the soil or for the regular regulation for upper side of the soil. For, uh, if the, uh, for, from the upside of the soil, the shredded paper will get wet. It is also effect to the quality of the products or maybe soil or something like that, Prof? 
Yes, um, you are right. Uh, um, how in, in terms of the effectiveness of the shredded paper mulch under the drip irrigation or uh, a kind of a, a sprinkler irrigation method, uh, as you said, if the irrigation water was put from the top and shredded paper absorb water, so in that case, the effectiveness of saving evaporation loss is not so expected. But then in case of drip irrigation or in case of a kind of a tube irrigation uh, using um, uh, mulch holes tubes, uh, saving water effectiveness by the shred of mulch will be very expected, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Prof, for the uh, excellent answer for my curious curiosity. Yeah. Okay, is there any other question? We still have five minutes for this discussion. Is there any other question? Uh, hello, I yes. want to ask a question to Dr. Maki. And yes, yes, my please. question is, uh, what are the evaluation parameter for uh, pen wire. Dr. Evaluation Maki? parameters for the quality of the fruit. Yes. Dr. Maki, okay. can you hear in the question? Dr. Maki? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yes. Do you mean the qu quality indices for the oil palm? The, the quality of the fruits or the quality of the oil? Uh, if possible, I want to know both of them. Sorry? I want to know uh, for fruit and also for the wire. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So for the fruits, uh, the quality will base on first uh, maturity, secondly, freshness, and then uh, the quality of uh, oil content, the fatty acid inside the oil and uh, finally uh, the quality of the moisture or the quantity of the moisture inside the fruits for the oil itself uh, mostly the oil will be calculated based on the concentration of free fatty fish uh, free fatty acid uh, impurity in the oil and then the freshness of the oil based on uh, deterioration. Oh, sorry, it's very, it's very long. Deterioriabilities of bleaching index or dobi, uh, which uh, measure the ratio of carotenes uh, in good condition or carotene in uh, non. Uh, destruct with carotene that already uh, soluble or already destruct and uh, it can be uh, obtained the value uh, through spectro spectrophotometry uh, technique. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Something okay, like thank you very, uh, very chemical part. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your okay. answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I will give uh, one minute to for the closing statement for each of the speaker. Prof. Hiroki Oiwe, Oiwe, Sensei, can you give closing statement for one minute? Okay, thank you very much for giving uh, one minute time. Uh, it's a quite nice opportunity for us to give a um, presentation in the start of such a very excellent uh, uh, conference. So I hope that uh, even under such a pandemic situation, uh, by discussing and by exchanging academic uh, knowledge and skills and uh, experiences, uh, we will be able to collaborate uh, academically uh, in your future. I also have an, uh, two students from Andaras University. And uh, uh, other than uh, Andaras University, I have many students from Indonesia. I would like to academically collaborate with you all. And uh, uh, even we even still staying in Japan and Indonesia, let's continue our 
uh, collaborative work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Yes, uh, let's give one minute closing statement time for Dr. Maki. Hello, Dr. Maki. Please give a closing statement. Sorry, Doc, still mute. Hello, Doc. Okay, thank you very much, moderator, for this opportunity. And uh, also uh, our best greeting to the presenter and all participants. So we are facing the condition of also facing global challenge due to the uh, disruptive uh, condition in uh, distribution and logistics and therefore we have to uh, answer this challenge through technology while the the same technology should promote the livelihood for smallholder farmers the livelihood for rural area and to promote the reduction of greenhouse gas emission and thus we help our planet by ourselves. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Maki, for the great presentation and closing remarks. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening this uh, first plenary session. Uh, I just want to give a highlight for uh, for the three of the speakers regarding their uh, speak. Uh, today so actually this pandemic effect to the all sector of uh, human life including agriculture and then all technology are uh, brought to the uh, better place to make uh, the impact of the pandemic can be solved uh, gently and uh, quickly so uh, from the professor Hiroki Oe uh, talk about the mousing technology using uh, shred, shred, uh, shred papers and then uh, Dr. Mo, uh, Mo, sorry, uh, Moh Rasti talking about Maki. the opportunities and challenges uh, post pandemic and then uh, Dr. Maki talking about the technology uh, non-destructive technology to measure the uh, palm fruits, fresh palm fruits. Okay, I think that's all for me, the moderator of the first plenary session. Uh, I would like to thanks to all the participants, all uh, speakers that contribute to this conference. And from me, if I make mistake, uh, I apologize and see you for the next conference. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for informative and insightful presentation from our distinguished speakers and our moderator. This time, I would like to call the speakers and our moderator to receive the token of appreciation from Andalas University. Firstly, Thank you to our first speaker in honor to Professor Hiroki Oi from Ehime University, Japan. Secondly, thank you to our second speaker in honor to Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Rasdi Zaini from University Technology Mara, Malaysia. Thirdly, thank you to our third speaker in honor to Associate Professor Dr. Engineering Muhammad Maki from Andalas University, Indonesia. Additionally, we would like to thank as well as to our moderator in honor to Mr. Zuhud Rozaki, PhD. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the agendas we have presented to you this morning on the first session. Dear participants, in this event we have two sessions as we have set up the lucky draw session. If you are chosen, please kindly report and mention your identity. Now we will start the first lucky draw session, which will be start with an SI account. One, 
two, three. Please spin the lucky wheel. Congratulations to Taskia Devira. Dear participant, stay tuned because we will have another lucky draw at the last session and don't miss it. Coming up to the last moment of the first session, we are going to have the next session. Please be note that our second session will be started at 12 past 5 p.m. after the lunch break. You can proceed into this room meeting. Um, ladies and gentlemen, quick reminder, because we have more time in the session, so we can uh, early the moment at uh, 11 past 30. So make sure that you are ready on the room at 11.30. Thank you.
Dr. Insinyur Ferry Arlius MSD, Dekan Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian Universitas Andalas Padang. Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian Universitas Andalas Padang lahir dari adanya tuntutan perkembangan zaman bagaimana penerapan teknologi di dalam bidang-bidang pertanian untuk mendapatkan hasil produksi yang lebih baik dan sesuai dengan kebutuhan masyarakat. Saat ini, Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian Universitas Andalas sudah berkembang menjadi satu fakultas baru yang mempunyai tiga jurusan yaitu teknik pertanian, teknologi hasil pertanian, dan teknologi industri pertanian. Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian Universitas Andalas bertekad untuk menjadi fakultas yang terkemuka di dalam pengembangan teknologi, terutama teknologi informasi yang berhubungan dengan Agriculture 4.0 yang tentu saja ke depan akan sangat dibutuhkan oleh masyarakat. Kami, Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian, sebagai salah satu wajah dari Universitas Andalas dan pengembangan program layanan untuk menciptakan generasi muda terbaik bangsa. Kami memiliki visi menjadi fakultas yang terkemuka dan bermartabat di ASEAN. Dalam pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan di bidang teknologi pertanian yang unggul dan inovatif pada tahun 2026. Program Studi S1 Teknologi Hasil Pertanian telah berdiri sejak tahun 1967 sewaktu masih berada di bawah Fakultas Pertanian Universitas Andalas. Pada program studi S1 Teknik Hasil Pertanian, saat ini terdapat empat bidang peminatan. Teknologi dan rekayasa proses pangan atau hasil pertanian, kimia atau biokimia hasil pertanian dan kisi pangan, mikrobiologi dan bioteknologi pangan dan hasil pertanian, dan total kualitas.
Quality Control dan Manajemen Industri Pertanian. Kami mempunyai misi menyelenggarakan pendidikan untuk pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan di bidang teknik pertanian dan biosistem, teknologi pangan dan pengolahan hasil pertanian, dan teknologi industri pertanian yang unggul untuk menghasilkan lulusan dengan kompetensi terbaik. Melaksanakan penelitian dasar dan terapan yang inovatif di bidang ilmu pengetahuan di bidang teknik pertanian dan biosistem, teknologi pangan dan pengolahan hasil pertanian, dan teknologi industri pertanian untuk mendukung pembangunan dan pengembangan IPTEK serta peningkatan perolehan haki dan publikasi ilmiah untuk kejayaan bangsa. Mendarma baktikan ilmu pengetahuan di bidang teknik pertanian dan biosistem, teknologi pangan dan pengolahan hasil pertanian, dan teknologi industri pertanian yang dikuasai untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat. Meningkatkan kualitas tata kelola organisasi yang baik dan membangun jejaring dengan stakeholder yang efektif dan efisien. Pada program studi S1 Teknologi Industri Pertanian, terdapat tiga bidang kajian. Teknologi rekayasa proses pengolahan agroindustri, teknik sistem dan manajemen agroindustri, dan teknologi lingkungan agroindustri. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our se our second session presentations, which will be present by our speakers, who will be led by our moderator, the Honorable Associate Professor T S Dr Shamsia Abdullah. Little introduction introduction about moderator. Associate Professor T.S. Dr. Samsiah Abdullah from University Technology Mara Malaysia, Deputy Dean Research, Innovation, Industry, Community, Community Alumni, Entrepreneurial Network, Faculty of Plantation and Agri-Technology, University Technology Mara Malaysia, Field on of special session, plant biotechnology, plant molecular and breeding, plant ecophysiology. Postgraduate from University Kebangsaan Malaysia in 2010. To Associate Professor T.S. Dr. Shamsia Abdullah, 
Please, the time is all yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, to Miss MC. Okay, I hope you can uh, hear me. Okay, doctor, we can okay. hear you. All right, okay, thank you very much. Clearly hear you. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good afternoon to our honorable guests, distinguished uh, speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, welcome back to the uh, second session of the International Conference on a Sustainable Agriculture and Biosystem, ICS AB 2021. Okay, I'm uh, Shamsia Abdullah from the uh, Faculty of Plantation and Agrotechnology, uh, University Technology Mara, Malaysia. So I'm going to be the chairman for this keynote session. Okay, shortly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to turn to three distinguished speakers. Okay, uh, or I can say uh, distinguished uh, researchers in their field who will share with us uh, their insight, experiences um, uh, from their research yeah, that related to the team of this conference. Okay, in this session. Uh, the speakers, uh, you are given uh, 25 minutes okay, uh, for the talk and the Q&A session will be open after the third speaker and her talk. Okay, To the participant, uh, just uh, a reminder, yeah? please remember to state your name and uh, where you are from and you may also write down the question in the chat room where I will uh, read it out for you. And please remember to immediately write down the question during the presentation so that you will not forget your question, okay? So before I call upon our first honourable speaker, let me read a brief introduction of his background. Okay, our first speaker is um, a Professor Sajif Ratan Sharma okay, from, uh, from the uh, University a professor from the College of Agriculture Engineering and Technology, Punjab University, India. He was granted his uh, PhD in the same university. Okay, he, he's expert in uh, processing and food engineering. Uh, the information I got from the um, uh, from the website of uh, Punjab University, it stated that his interest in value addition of agriculture produce, processing of uh, spice uh, crops, and enhancement in shell life of perishable, which is in line with his presentation today entitled "Post Harvest Management of Fruits and Vegetables." So without further ado, please join me in welcome Professor Sajif Ratan Sharma to deliver his speech. Sir, the time is yours. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, Dr. Shamsia Abdullah, to, to speak with this August gathering. So I'm thankful to Dr. Ferry Arilas, Dean of Faculty, Agriculture, Agricultural Technology. I'm also thankful to Dr. Khandra Femi, so Chairman of the conference invited speakers, faculty of the university, participants and scientists attending this conference from other places, ladies and gentlemen. So the topic on which I'm going to discuss today, that is about the post-harvest and vegetables. So talking about, about the theoretical aspect as well as the practical aspect 
of the post harvest management of fruits and vegetables which we want to convey to our farmers so as far as the production is concerned so india ranks second in the production of fruits and vegetables with the total production of more than 190 million metric tons in case of fruits or oh sorry in case of vegetables and close to 100 million metric tons in case of fruits but the problem which we find here in india is that the post harvest losses they are maximum in the world so we rank first in that and on a, on an average 25 to 40% of the fruits and vegetables so we occur these losses after harvesting so to plug in the things so we need to do the proper management of the fruits and vegetables so th this is the state you can say it's a waste after the production so you can see that how many opportunities have been lost so we want to save what is there after the harvest so these losses we want to save and this is happening everywhere so so how to save that so for saving or for uh, you can say reducing the losses so we have to know what are the basic theories because of which we are uh, uh, losing some of our production so if we can save the losses indirectly we can increase the production so the farmers can get more prices so for that purpose so the three basic things which are very important in case of fruits and vegetables they are the respiration rate then water content and the injury if there is an injury to the produce so about the respiration rate so all of you know fruits they are living so they also respire so when they respire so they give off heat so if we can slow down their respiration rate then we will be able to increase the shelf life of the produce that is the first thing so about the management of the horticulture produce the first thing is we have to slow down its respiration rate if we can slow down its respiration rate so they will survive for longer period similarly second thing is so they contain lot of water more than 80% 85% of water content or they have moisture content more than that so if we can provide them the conditions where they don't lose moisture or water to the environment then they will remain fresh for a longer period i'm, uh, I'm sorry prof uh, could you pardon? please send to the uh, slide show pardon uh, the slide show send your powerpoint to the slide show because it's too small it is it small so let me uh, uh, yeah. yeah you can click uh, one icon at the bottom yeah. of the slide it's not showing i just a minute that's not show so ma'am let me let me do that okay uh -huh. is it fine now ah uh, yes okay thank you very much okay okay thank you so the moisture content so if we can provide environment in such a way that they don't lose moisture to the environment so we can keep it for a longer period so that is our second priority that they remain fresh for a longer period and the third thing is the injury so if they are injured if they are um, you can say they have some issues if we can protect them from any type of injury or bruises so because when the injury is there injury to the fruit or vegetable is there then what happens their senescence uh, their uh, respiration rate again increases and along with that so these fruits and vegetable 
they take oxygen they give off carbon dioxide along with that they also produce ethylene which is uh, uh, you can say at a, uh, if it is injured the injury is at faster the in, uh, uh, injury is there then the ethylene uh, gas production is at a faster rate so all these three things if you can manage these three things so then whatever procedure we adopt so they will be helpful in the proper management of fruits and vegetables so that is the basic crux base upon which we do the post harvest management now once the crop has been harvested so generally in india so the farmers what they do they bring it to their to their uh, you can say uh, to the nearby markets directly so but there are some set procedures which we guide to the farmers that if you want to manage the your crop properly so that you can get good remuneration for your crop so you should follow these procedures so before packaging so we have to do some of the things so depending upon if we are exporting it or sending it to distant market or um, sending it to close by markets so some of the things some of the procedures which are relevant to a particular crop that should be followed so they are called the pack house operations like before packaging so there is a pack house where we can perform these operations like pre sorting so if any so this is done after harvest and before pre cooling so generally this harvesting is done when the um, uh, the temperature of the you can say surrounding is low comparatively either early in the morning or late in the evening so that's how the harvesting is done and then it it is pre cooled so before pre cooling they are subject to pre sorting so that if there is any injured fruit or infected fruit or decayed fruit so that can be sorted out and then we can get good crop which is free from these and that can be Uh, put for the pre cool pre cooling so that is called the pre sorting the next thing and the very important thing which needs to be done is the pre cooling so why pre cooling is required if we if you uh, you can say we want to reduce their respiration so immediately after harvesting and doing the pre sorting we put the fruits and vegetables at it we try to bring it to a optimal temperature conditions so under optimal temperatures where we try to bring it to a low low temperature conditions and at this moment when we are pre cooling the produce so our main aim is that its field heat should be removed so whatever heat because when the fruit is attached to the plant so it is its requirements are fulfilled by the plant itself but once we have harvested so we have to take care of this so immediately we have to remove the uh, bring it to a lower temperature that is called pre cooling by pre cooling we can save it from spoilage and its quality can be maintained so when we go for the pre cooling there are different methods which are used for the uh, its pre cooling these include room cooling so we can put it in a room and the cooling can be done so where the temperature is low air cooling so we supply air with some velocity to the produce and cool it down or hydro cooling so cooling with the help of the water so these type of processes like you can see the hydro cooling of carrots and shower type hydro coolers are there and, or you can put it into the room so the basic of Objective in pre cooling is to remove the field heat, right? So that is that. Then the next step is you can say washing, washing or cleaning. 
So some of the fruits and vegetables, they need to be washed. Some of the fruits and vegetables, they should not be washed. They should be cleaned only. Like apple, etc. They are cleaned with dry brushes only. Similarly, the fruits which have a natural wax on their surface, they should not be washed because that wax, natural wax, you, uh, will try to give a good environment to the produce. So that should not be uh, washed. Otherwise, that layer will get moved from the surface. But these citrus fruits and carrots, they need to be washed. So we'll have to wash them for doing the cleaning. So for further, you can say before packaging, we have to clean that. So once we have washed it, we'll put it in the, uh, you can say open so that that can be dried as well. Drying doesn't mean we are putting it under some temperature just to remove the surface water. And whenever we have to use the uh, water, so always use the chlorinated water. So 100 to 150 ppm chlorine water should be used, which can be prepared by making uh, use of the calcium hypochlorite. Similarly, some of the vegetables they like cauliflower or cabbage they are subjected to trimming or top or topping prior to packaging so that by removing external leaves or non-edible parts so non-edible part is smooth so if someone has a tie up with an industry so there the the industry people let us say with the hotel industry so there the people they will give you the price only for the part which they are going to use. So, to save our transportation costs, so this trimming or topping, that should be done. So, you can see this is how the washing of the citrus fruit is being done. So, in the commercial plant, so uh, all the machines, they are available. But if a farmer has to do it, so he can uh, simply uh, use uh, the facilities which he can uh, arrange at his own level. So otherwise, there are machines which which are used for sanding the material and washing and then drying and all that. Then which can be done in the pack houses waxing. As I have already told you that some of the fruits and veg have a natural wax. So waxing is a process. So to give proper environment to the fruits, some of the fruits and vegetables, so that it can be saved, so the moisture loss doesn't occur to the environment, doesn't happen. If the outside conditions, atmospheric conditions are different, so it helps to save the moisture within the product. So the common process which is done, like waxing of kinnus, so a citrus fruit, which is there in India. So apples and peaches, etc. And vegetables like capsicum, tomatoes, brinjal, cucumber. So they can be, we can go for waxing on these fruits and vegetables. So whenever we have to use the wax coating, so it should be food grade. So the wax which we use, that should be food grade and not otherwise. And once we have applied the wax, then it should be dried a little bit so that it, it, it doesn't stay wet on the surface. And these food grade wax that is available for different brand with different brand names, I have listed a, one or two like the Stay Fresh Company. So um, it sells the wax, which is basically the bees wax. So which is which we get from the bees, honey bees. Similarly, Citra Shine Company, so it gives us from a shellac plant. So the, the wax which oozes out from the plant, so that is from there they produce the vaccine. So that wax can be used to give fruits and vegetables the proper environment so that we can enhance their shelf life. So this is how the, so it is in the liquid form, it is being sprayed on the kinos and then dried a little bit and then sent for further operations. 
Similarly, we say to the farmers that they should grade their produce. So grading can be done on different basis. Like it can be done on the basis of size or color, or you can say the weight of the material or the ripening stage. So there are different standards in India for by the, you can say their standards have been fixed. If you have to sell it after grading, similarly for export purposes, so the grading, there are standards which we have to follow for doing the grading. So if we do the grading, we get more prices. So as far as the layman person is concerned, so we just convey to them that if you are not grading it, so out of 100 kg, we get A grade quality of 30 kg, B grade of 30 kg and C grade of 40 kg. So just grade it. Otherwise, you will get the price for the 40 kg of produce. Like okra, they can be graded based upon their length. So the smaller one it will be a little bit uh, soft one. So people will prefer to um, prepare the vegetables with that as compared to the other one. Similarly, in the case of carrots. So if you do the grading, so the soft or you can say the uh, carrots, which are not having that much diameter. So they will be like for the purpose of salad making or for the purpose of uh, um, preparing vegetables at home. But the larger ones, they can be used by these uh, the person who makes sweets. They can use it over there. So we always recommend to the farmers that they should go for grading of the produce so that they can fetch more prices. So at a, at a commercial level in the industry now, here the grading is being done on the size as well as on the color basis. So this, this is okra, so being, being graded. So this is how the canoes. So there are machines, uh, equipment. So based upon the size, they are doing grading. So then in a uh, package, so it can be uh, seven dozens or 10 dozens. So accordingly, the standards are there, which there is a directorate of marketing and inspection in India. So when you sell it to the Mondays, means the markets, this vegetable market or fruit market. So accordingly, you can, if you grade them, you can fetch more prices. Then some of the fruits and the vegetables mainly the fruits, so we harvest them. So, so I hope you all know about that there are climacteric fruits and non-climacteric fruits. So climacteric fruits means they can ripen after they have been harvested. Whereas the non-climacteric fruits have to be harvested once they are ripe. So the climacteric fruits if we let it ripen at the plant, so their shelf life will be very less. So for that reason, these fruits, they are harvested at a particular stage before the ripening space. And they are ripened afterwards, like papaya, and this uh, banana, mangoes. So, and the, the People, they generally, sometimes they use their own practices for writing these by the help of the uh, packets and put it in the fruits while they are being transported. And within, let us say, if they are going for 72 hours of transportation, so within that, so the gases, basically the ethylene gas will evolve with uh, these uh, you can say uh, chemicals and they will, it will ripen the fruits. But the thing is, so it, it will not be uniform ripe. So the proper procedure for ripening should be adopted. So like in case of mangoes, so what we have to do, the standard procedure is washing of mangoes in water by drying means 
followed by surface drying, then dipping into ethephone. So there is a chemical available that is called ethephone at the rate 500 ppm for 5 minutes. And then after drying, put it into the boxes. Then we store it at normal temperature. So by doing this, the mangoes of better quality will be ready to eat after 4 days. When we take it out after 4 days, so they will be uniformly ripened. Similarly, in case of uh, banana, we are not dipping it into the solution. What we do? So, there is a uh, room, we say it, a ripening chamber and there is a ethylene generator. So, there is a generator in which we put ethyl alcohol and which ethyl alcohol gets converted into ethylene gas and we switch it on. So, we run this generator into the ripening chamber for 8 hours and then the rooms, they are kept closed for 24 hours. So, within those 24 hours, that ethylene gas, it acts on the bananas. After this, you remove, open the doors and let the flu gases and the gases come out for 10 minutes. Again, put these stuff, all the uh, bananas, maintain a temperature of 20 degrees centigrade. So, you will see that the color of the bananas, it will start turning to yellow and a uniform color will be obtained. So, that is the ripening method which can be adopted in the pack house. So, you can see if we have treated it in a with the help of the, by adopting the proper procedure or if it is done not like that, then there is a difference. So, the farmers can fetch more prices. So, once all this has been done in the pack house, then the packaging is done. So, basically when we have to package something for the farmer, so we think about what type of, you can say, packages are required. So, one is for bulk packages, which we use it for sending to long distance transportation. And second is the retail packages, the consumer packages. So, bulk packages, within bulk packages, we can put the consumer packages. So, that when it reaches to the market, so it, the outer packaging, bulk package can be opened up and the retail packages can be used. Or uh, sometimes, for these fruits and vegetables, mostly the packaging materials which are adopted, they are the jute or the cotton bags, bamboo baskets, wooden boxes, corrugated fiber wood boxes, and plastic crates. So, as far as the jute or the bamboo or the wooden boxes, these days we don't recommend that we should go for these jute bags or the bamboo baskets or the wooden boxes. Reason being, so the quality of the produce that is not maintained. So in the bamboo basket, there are chances of, you can say, injury to the fruit or the vegetable. Similarly, in the jute boxes, so there will be bruising. If we, let us say, if we put the cauliflower in the bag, so the bruising will be there, the, it will become dirty, the white color will not be there, you will fetch less price. Similarly, in case uh, of wooden boxes... Sir, sir, you have five more minutes for the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Five minutes? Okay. So, we 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 say that the corrugated fiberboard boxes should be used where we have to place it for distance market. Whereas the plastic crates, they should be used from where we can bring it back. So because the plastic crates can be put one above the other. So like this, so these plastic crates should not be overfilled. They should be kept, it should not be filled to the brim. Kept low. You can keep, uh, keep this. So, and in corrugated boxes, you have to uh, think about so what what should be the strength of the boxes and uh, we can pack 10 kg of 
quinoa's whereas for grapes it should be packed in 2 kg so because they are soft we cannot keep larger so moreover the holes are to be made so that when the fruits and the vegetable will be respiring so heat will be generated that heat has to be removed so for that purpose so these are some of the you can say uh, boxes which are used for this purpose so a single type of box it can be formed into this stage similarly this is the telescopic box which can be used like this so for uh, peas so generally we give the same color for tomatoes so the you can see the bottle guard tagged in the sleeves and put it into the shipping containers so similarly for, for uh, okra we use jumble packing so in one go so up to 2 kg only whereas for the quinoa so 10 kg of the produce that can be put so similarly for the plastic crates we always say that uh, we can send the produce as i have already mentioned to one place from where uh, to the place from where we can bring it back otherwise it will not be feasible so it can be used for in the pack house it can be used in for the local market or for the storage in cold stores so the packages so these consumer packages they are they should be weighed so 1 kg or half kg depending upon the requirement of the family so uh, that should be used again these should be uh, the, uh, when we are using the plastic material so these should be micro perforated for onion and garlic we always say that mesh bags are recommended because they require lesser relative humidity around it so this is how the consumer packages can be made about the storage when we store the product so earlier in india so the uh, top uh, picture where we were storing so that was being used now we we recommend that walk in cool chambers because if we keep the produce together mix produce together so what will happen so there are some fruits and vegetables which are ethylene gen, uh, generating ethylene like i told you these uh, papaya and the bananas and all that so and others are the ethylene sensitive produce so if we keep them together so what will happen so the vegetables or the cucumber the green color will go off these carrots will become bitter so similarly eggplant seeds and pulp that will get brown similar using Having fruits and vegetables, they should be kept aside. As far as the temperature is concerned, so generally, every produce there is a different temperature. Generally, we say so it ranges in between zero to eight degree, and the humidity is eighty-five to ninety percent for relic, uh, for uh, leafy vegetables. It is ninety to ninety percent, and for onion and garlic, it should be stored at seventy percent R. So. we should take care of these that uh, we maintain a proper relative humidity and the temperature if we keep the summer vegetables or the fruits at low level so the chilling injury or freezing injury may take place so that should be taken care of about the transportation <coughs> so we have to see where we have to send it how we want to send it what will be the cost of the produce whether we are going to pay more for the transportation and ultimately will be fetching less price so for that so this is scenario where the produce is being taken in the month you can see and ultimately what happens because of the weight so produce gets spoiled so we should take into consideration that so um, if we are um, taking it into the open vehicles we should uh, make arrangement we should make provision for the wind catcher to allow the passage of fresh air through the produce so that the heat because of the respiration that can be taken out similarly we should always try to cover the uh, produce in the trucks with the light colored canvas so that should be done so we should make arrangement that proper air is being circulated while transporting the material in the 
you can say the open vehicles. When we go for the refrigerated vans, so they are available on rent. So we should check the desired nature. The produce should be kept with comfortable uh, comfortably while loading and unloading. Similarly, do keep a gap around the walls and at the end of the gate. Okay, right? And so we can, if we are using the crates, we can humidify the environment by spray cool water or covering open crates of produce with wet towels. And it is recommended to use plastic crates for transportation to local and medium distance market, whereas for transporting it to long distance market, so, so you, uh, you can uh, use the corrugated fiberboard boxes. That is the uh, crux for the, you can say, using the packaging material. So crates and the corrugated fiberboard boxes, so which, which can help in preventing the vibrations or the compression. So these are the uh, type of refrigerated vans which are being used and so that the vibrations are not there. So this bracing can be put so with the, uh, you can say the walls so that the movement is not restricted. So if we do all this, we take into consideration the storage temperatures, the transportation facilities, what we are going to do. So then we can reduce the losses. So and and if the quality will be maintained, so the farmers, they can fetch good prices. So ultimately, as I said earlier, so basically the respiration rate, we have to slow down the respiration rate. We have to reduce the loss of moisture. And the third thing is to save it from the injury. So that's all for my lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much uh, for a very uh, fantastic presentation okay and for uh, actually enriching our knowledge in this area of uh, post harvest okay. uh, I, I guess it really shows your strong interest uh, in this field and I actually agree with you professor that uh, the post harvest losses is not uh, a new thing yeah, to the agricultural sectors and um, the physical looks of the produce is very important because this will uh, actually uh, determine the price of the products. Okay? So from the presentation, uh, we also learn processes okay, step by step uh, what we need to follow in order to reduce the loss. And it also depends on the type of agriculture produced. So um, I'm cert very certain yeah, the audience can't wait to ask questions yeah, related to the presentation. Unfortunately, we have to hold it until the third speaker, uh, the third speaker and the uh, Talk, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me to give uh, Professor Sajif a big round of applause. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Sajif, so and please stay. Uh, I will call you during the Q and A session. Okay, thank you again, Prof. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, now we proceed to our uh, second uh, keynote speaker. Okay, our. Uh, Next uh, speaker is Dr. Wida Susanti Haji Suhaili from the University of Technology Brunei uh, Darussalam. Okay, Prof Associate Professor uh, Dr. Wida Susanti obtained his PhD in Education Technology from the Edinburgh University. And she has also been very active with the Asian IVO project since 2018. Okay, recent, uh, recent research focus was uh, is in the SMART initiative project uh, involving Internet of Things. Uh, very lovely uh, children you have, uh, Dr. Vida. So, uh, to call Dr. Hadi Sohaili to deliver your uh, speech. So, the floor is, thank, is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, let me... Try to share. Thank you. 
Yeah, kami di respected distinguished guests, distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to express my sincere gratitude um, for the invitation as keynote speaker to the fourth international conference on sustainable agriculture and biosystem ICSAB 2021, and I am glad to be part of this well-organized conference. Um, can, can you see my my slides? Yes, doctor. Um, but can you take me to slide show? Okay. Are we okay? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Right, so my title is Adoption of Technology to Improve Self-Sufficiency in Pet Plantation for, in particular, Brian Darussalam. I'll be sharing the challenges and the mitigation strategies for immediate stakeholders, yeah, from the immediate stakeholders. So uh, just a little bit of introduction of Brunei. Uh, so where is Brunei? It is located, uh, it is part of Southeast Asia with a land size of 5,765 kilometer. Our population is, uh, we haven't reached uh, half a million yet, and with our main industry, which is oil and gas. In terms of, you know, okay. Right, so as mentioned earlier on, I've been involved with uh, ASEAN IVO project since 2018. So I was very fortunate to be um, collaborating with uh, respective researchers from um, Myanmar, Thailand, as well as Malaysia for our wat smart watering system paddy. So some of the presentation today will be comprising of those findings as well. Um, I'm also one of the fellowship for ASEAN Science and Technology 2019-2020. Why I'm mentioning this is because I was very fortunate during my fellowship, I was um, involved with MPRT, which is the Min uh, Ministry of Primary Resource and Tourism, where I was um, under the supervision of our my mentor, which is Khairun Isaji Omar Ali, as well as Sheikh Razi, Dr. Patrika Sheikh Haji Adnan. These are basically the paddy, paddy experts in, our, in Brunei. So I have the opportunity to do side visits to two of the main uh, producer uh, of our paddy, which is in Wasan as well as in Kando. And I also have a contact Ogier where we actually use irrigation, where we, our water are hosted in, in a certain lake. I'll be explaining that as well. And I'm also exposed to the uh, soil, soil, soil feature of our, our country because most of the soil is basically acidic. And in terms of industry linkages, uh, um, because I have uh, adoption of technology, so I'm also involved with uh, Onion as well as Innovero for the drone, right? So up to date, basically, there is, there is no policy on irrigation for paddy plantation in Brunei. So we will actually want to see um, in terms of the agenda, uh, my, present, agenda pres my presentation will be on the need for policy in addressing irrigation issues for paddy plantation. Um, the slide that I've shared is basically uh, up the updated to what I have currently now. So I hope the if the if the organizer can actually just project my, my presentation instead of the one that I shared, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. So the agenda for the, to this presentation is to address uh, the policy in addressing irrigation. Why do we need policy? And then to explain to you the Brunei's paddy context in terms of general and more specifically towards Wasan and how we adopt in terms of technology from it to be technology projects, the ASEAN IVO projects, as well as the project that we're currently deploying. And I'll be focusing then further towards the policy, what sort of policy should be in place and the possible collaboration projects that we can actually collaborate with. Right, so in Brunei, basically, um, we only pre our produce is very minimal because we only be 4% of our self-sufficiency. Most of our, our paddy um, uh, availability is basically from imports. So as you can see, we actually imported quite a large amount of paddy from other countries. So we are basically focusing on paddy from uh, Thailand as well as Cambodia. And if you can look uh, into this particular slide, the gap is quite big, quite massive, where our local produce is in terms of 200 grams gaps, whereas in, in terms of imports, we're actually importing around 2,000. You know, that, that's a big gap, a huge gap, actually. So our local production cannot meet this local demand. Okay, this is very something that is um, uh, that is one that the government would like to actually uh, improve. Yeah. 
So this is the uh, brass that we're actually eating. So we have brass wangi, brass siam. So as you can see, these are all Thai, 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 Thai paddy, right? And you can see in terms of our zakat, the zakat is also using this brass siam uh, cost. So that shows how we're actually relying a lot on this import, import paddy, right? So we actually have a number of variety in Brunei. So because to, in order to do self-sufficiency, we look into several rice varieties. So we have Brass Lila, Brass BDR5, the Q76. And just two years ago, we actually launched Sembada 188. So the, the reason why we're changing varieties is because we're trying to improve the yield because these are resistance, some of the strong resistance varieties that we actually, and then uh, strong op, in terms of yield, it produces more. Okay. So the, I was involved because I was involved in the fellowship. So I have to be exposed to quite a number of primary as well as secondary stakeholders. So the knowledge that I gain in terms of the contacts are basically from these respective people. So let's move on to Brunei's Padix context. How is it and what, what, can we, what can we know about it? So in Brunei, basically, we are actually using... Um, uh, we are adopting some modern technology. So in terms of land preparation, we're actually using, in terms of leveling, we actually use uh, our, there's a, a, to level it. So we can actually use transplanted to plant uh, the, the seedlings and we actually have harvested to harvest. So these are the mechanized things that we actually uh, use instead of the traditional ways. And in terms of rainfall, we are not fall, fall far behind. So our average rainfall is basically higher. So we shouldn't have an issue in terms of rainfall, but uh, I will highlight that, that our main problem in Brunei is basically irrigation. So why is this happening? So um, this is what we're going to look into. Okay, so with the amount of rainfall, it's actually uh, hosted in in particular with the, the big two plots that I shared earlier on in Wasan. Um, we actually have one uh, imam dam, we call it imam dam. So this imam dam, we actually, it was erected and it can actually hold around 10 million cubic meters of water you know, in terms of volumes of water. So this actually irrigate to several irrigation plots that is shown in, in the circular, uh, in, this, in this figure, yeah? And these are basically the, the agricultural development areas where the pink polygons are basically where the paddy fields are. So we have Wasan, Babulo, Batumpu, Panchul Murai, Batong, but my concentration will be on Wasan in particular. Okay, so in Wasan, basically, uh, it's one of the biggest because um, it, it the the pipelines, which is from among them, is actually directed to, to this particular plot. Yeah? So it's actually managed by Kostika and MPP, and it have a two-month rest after the farming activity. So in Brunei, we actually have two planting season, yeah? the first season as well as the second season. So we can actually call it one is the wet season and the other one is dry. So it depends on the amount of rainfall. And this is in particular Wasan, so uh, before and after harvest. Okay, So this is just some of the plots and the plots that we are given access to. And as I mentioned just now with the pipes, the piping, it, um, the, the, the water from the imang dam is actually irrigated and transported using this pipe. Okay. And then it's going to be open using the valve so it can then enter the respective field. So the, the, the technique that is being used in, in Austin in particular is using flood irrigation technique. I think that it's one of the reasons why um, the, the issue of water, because uh, if all the plots are adopting flood irrigation technique, that's the reason why the water can be tend to be not enough for plots which are far away from the uh, the pipes. Yeah, right. So in general, this is basically how it looks like. So how it is being managed in terms of flood irrigation techniques, where water will be uh, will be provided from the pipes through the valve, and then uh, irrigated through canals before it enters the respective fields. Yeah. So upon discussion with the respective pengusaha uh, ladang, what we call the farmers, so they highlighted quite a few issues with uh, uh, how they manage the uh, the paddy plantation and the issues that they face. So with the help of uh, my students, so we actually uh, we actually embark on quite a few projects. And we, today I'm going to present some of the findings, uh, some of, of some of the projects. Yeah, right. So paddy life cycle in Brunei, as we know, it have three stages. Okay, and paddy from the very beginning is actually a water intensive crop okay um so it's set with just one seed and it can actually produce quite a number of grains just from one particular seed and for the for the particular yield that we're looking into the variety it took around 110 days duration where unfortunately because of our soil condition the acidic soil uh the the practice is basically to replace this water weekly yeah <laughs> no, replace the water every four weeks because to prevent the iron and aluminum buildup. Okay, inside the inside the, the paddy field. 
So this is to basically to address the soil acidity. But after going through, I can actually then mention why, how we can actually evolve and uh, solve this problem. Okay, so uh, we in Brunei, we actually took uh, a lot of effort to help the farmers. So this is basically the paddy timeline eh, for particular beras laila. So the, all the farmers are given a, a structured way of how, when to plant, when to produce uh, APK, you know, when to provide fertilizer, etc. So this was actually shared to the respective farmers. But unfortunately, the, the problem lies, you know, so because of the lack of efficient irrigation, okay, the pro improper management of things, because of the soil quality and data, because they did not lime it properly. And then there's also the pests, pests and birds problem that affect the post, uh, pre post having, uh, post, before post having, post harvest, yeah. Okay. So these are some of the issues that were, were highlighted to us. So my concern would be more, most the application part yeah, for this particular um, in terms of the adoption of technology but while for the soil as well as for the bird I'm going to look into it in terms of a policy okay and if you look currently nowadays we are facing climate change so we need to actually put a lot of effort in order to ensure food security as well as our to improve our self-sufficiency and so we technology in terms of technology how, how are we going to look into this then Okay, so we have IR 4.0. So we're looking into maybe use case of AI, robotics, agriculture. So this way to, towards the future where uh, Dr. Maki has also already adopted in terms of the drone. So hopefully we'll be there soon, inshallah. And by that, we can actually then uh, look into how we go for precision farming. Yeah? So what is the adoption of technology in ETB then? Okay, so our aim is basically to introduce the use of technology to improve yield and address irrigation issues for paddy plantation in Brunei Darussalam with these several objectives in mind. Yeah, so I'm going to show you what we have done so far. So in terms of technological projects, um, this is actually um, a very effective way of doing things from IRI. Um, it is already tested and validated in the Philippines, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Indonesia, and Lao PDR. So it's, it's called alternate wetting and drying. Okay, so what happened is uh, it's, it can actually confirm that you can, the paddy doesn't really need that much, that large amount of water. We can actually follow a certain um, range for it to, to grow well and to produce just enough, good enough yield as well. Okay, so we just, uh, the, the particular, the adoption is basically just using types and measurement, you know, so that is uh, without adopting the technology. But since we are in ETB, so we try to look into how we can adopt technology to, to address this. So we we understand from here we know the water demand is basically with phases. So at a certain stage it requires five centimeters of water, ten centimeters of water. So these are the readings of water level that we need to ensure in the paddy field, yeah, for around those days. And in the towards the later stage stage, we don't really need to monitor the water anymore because it's going to go for the harvesting. So the critical part is basically where the water is required is during the vegetative as well as the season stage. This is the amount of water that we need to ensure that the availability as well as the consistency is there. So how do we do that? It's basically to adopt uh, alternate wetting and drying, the automatic, to automate it, as well as to look into possibility of having a water gate design. So this was actually just a prototype from our, our final year students. But uh, from this that finding, it uh, provided us with uh, some knowledge on how to, to go to the next level. So it was actually presented during our Haribli 2019, and we presented it in front of His Majesty. So it was quite a good experience for our students to showcase their projects. Um, so we, we have the opportunities where the projects in 2018, we were we managed to secure ASEAN IVO project. So ASEAN IVO project, they funded this project, uh, which is a two, two years project. So to, through this project, we collaborated uh, with researchers as well as developers from NECTEC, like Thailand, Myanmar, UCSY, and UTM from Malaysia. Okay, so what we are looking into because of the issue of acidic soil, we have to monitor the pH level as well as because we're adopting AWT, we're looking into monitoring the water level as well. So with the with the knowledge of among them as well as for Wasan, so we come up with this. Um, um, so the solution will be we're going to monitor the water level in terms of rainfall. So we, uh, we have embarked on two weather stations as well as several sensor nodes. So the weather station is basically erected in Imangadam as well as in Paddy Office in Wasan. 
or is the sensor nodes are basically for the respective body field that we are looking into in terms of water levels, soil moisture, soil temperature, as well as pH sensor. Yeah. Right, so for among them, we have erected it. So in terms of security, we put cage to it, so it's not uh, it's not going to be you know, destroyed or, or kind of stolen by anyone. So we protected it, and we have uh, uh, we acquire assistance from the the helper to actually ensure that it's it's always clean, yeah. Because of the if not the root will the grass will just overgrow the and then we will not get an accurate reading. So this is properly maintained. Okay, so we actually got a consistent result, our data uh, in terms of rainfall. So we've been collecting it since uh, July, June 2020. Yeah? So we have a steady data. Right, so this is from Imang Dam. And then because of, um, because of the security issues in Wasan, we actually moved our uh, deployment site to IBT Agro. IBT Agro is actually 7.7 .7 kilometer from Imang Dam. Um, so what we notice is basically uh, there's no much difference in terms of property as well as rainfall. So the only difference is in terms of the rainfall will be slightly later, you know, so the, there's only a time difference where it will reach, the, the rain will reach the certain uh, in IBT Agro slightly later than uh, from Imang Dam. Okay. So this is IBT Wasan. Uh, IBT Wasan is basically one of the institute for our it uh, help with agriculture as well. So it's very fortunate that we they have I think ten plots, yeah, ten plots. So we're given two plots to play around with to to test our element. So we actually deploy our reservoir, our water weather station at uh, on the reservoir because they have two reservoir there, and then we also also deploy our sensor nodes to the respective field. So in in this particular field, we are looking at field plot six as well as seven. Yeah. Okay. So this is the data. So we look into in terms of water level. So if you see the data that we are collecting is basically to up to a certain period of time. The reason being, as I mentioned earlier on, we are paddy has a life cycle of 110 days, but out of 110 days, we only monitor it around two cycles only. So around two period. So that, that is the duration of water level monitoring that we need to do for adopting AWD. Yeah. Uh, and because of we would like to automate it, so we were thinking of trying to in to look into the WaterGate, automated WaterGate as well. So uh, within ASEAN, the adoption of WaterGate was actually um, mechanized. Yeah? So it's either using, uh, in, as, ensure, as shown in the picture, whether it's a uh, rotate or, or metallic, you know. So these are all still mechanized with human strength. So, and then in Japan, basically, it's a very uh, cheap, or can actually just use, um, you know, a board, a hard board, or a U shape, a, a C, uh, an L shape pipe. Okay, to actually um, uh, release the water from the respective paddy field. But as you can see, the structure we don't have any cemented paddy field because we actually use uh, soil to erect it as bun. Okay, so we cannot adopt that. So basically, what we are looking into is something low powered, something low cost. So just recently, we presented this uh, designing of rotation water gate for paddy field irrigation, which was presented by our student Akudin. So we actually tried to uh, use um, low cost barrel, you know, to actually use that uh, the water pressure from the field and outfield to actually float acting as a flot flotation mechanism. So the water level sensor will actually detect whether the, the required water needs to be up to a certain level or not. So this will then uh, communicate with the with the with the water with the water gate to open or close. Yeah. So that's how we actually and it was already presented and hopefully the paper will publish soon. Yeah. So um so this is the way forward for our smart watering system project because we still have one more year left. To, to undergo certain um, changes and well improvement. So all the equipment are now um, improved, you know, to, to because initially it was for Wasan, but now it's for IBT Wasan Agro. So we have made some alteration to, to the paddy field because of the size, etc. cetera. Um, so that will be hopefully be, be able to be put once the COVID SOP will be reduced slightly, make it lenient so we can then um, plant it for deploy it further. Uh, we also need to validate all the, the data that we've been collecting so we can actually finalize our dashboard so this can then be shared to the respective farmers. Yeah. So in terms of moving on to the policy policy because uh, what we know what we notice is if we do adopt technologies but the policy does not um, Govern it, so it's still uh, it could be a waste. So we're looking into some recommendation and suggestion to look into how this can be, you know, can be improved. So as I mentioned, we are facing a climate change. 
change. Okay, so if we don't do anything to it, we might suffer. So because in it was predicted that it is predicted that if we do not do anything, the impact of climate change will affect in terms of our rice price. So because when the growth rate reduces, the price for barrack will increase. And for us in Brunei, and particularly in Indonesia as well, paddy or rice is basically our staple of food, right? So we need to ensure that we, we secure this for our food security. Right. So factors that could actually affect and causes that, that cause the water irrigation issues in Brunei is because of the weather element. This was not that it was never recorded before. So it was never taken into consideration. So because of the absence of weather station, but Shukur Alhamdulillah with the ASEAN IBO project, we, we have now have erected. Um, several weather station in the respective uh, paddy plantation. So we have one in Kandol, one in Imang Dam, as well as one in Aditi Agro. And then the water pump and release on a daily basis for Imang Dam. So this actually put a lot of pressure to the pump. Yeah. So it does not look into because of the no the 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 absence of weather station, the pump keeps on working every day. So even though it fits rain or not, so they still pump. So that's why it needs to, when this weather station is being. Uh, um, formalize as well as our system then put in place so hopefully we'll be able to you know regulate the use of water pump to pump the water from among, for the among them and it can prolong the pump as well water fill the canal to ensure enough water so because of the practice the the flood irrigation technique so that needs to be addressed and then and one of the reason as well we can actually look into um, the water the is the run we can actually see some runoff and water pockets so that shows that that indicates to you that the some of the land was not properly level in the first place so that's the reason why they are facing this problem yeah and then uh, the occurrence of um, soil acidity when we talk when we discuss with the respective farmers uh, some actually did not. Uh, practice it in full, in full weather because they actually advise to do it two weeks, two weeks on um, treatment for for lining beforehand, but they did not actually do that. So that's the reason why they opted for flushing the water instead. So that put a lot of burn. So if that that could be you know improved in terms of policy, that could should actually improve our irrigation issues. So to address this irrigation Can issues, uh, you have five minutes more. Yeah. Okay, sure, no worries. Okay. So we should actually follow the climate and weather elements yeah, to control among them. So we need to save water, save, save electricity, as well as to extend the pump life. So this can be actually obtained through proper land leveling and adopting so alternate, alternate wetting and drying, as well as the soil treatment needs to be done beforehand. Yeah. So some of the policies that are available that we can actually adopt are basically some from FAO, you know, some from you you need FCC. So these are basically what we have found out that it is already available. We just have to put things in place. Uh, in terms of land leveling, it's also mentioned there. And then uh, some some actually use laser leveling, yeah, to improve yield. And these are some of the policy as well. And when we look into alternate wetting and drying, it's actually adopted in several other countries at the same time. So because we're trying to convince the ministry at that stage, yeah. So this is actually in place after we proceeded with this uh, policy approach and also soil treatment because this is very important because if we do not do this we're actually exhausting our, our soil and at the end of the day wasn't could actually close because of we did not treat it well yeah and ensure we end these things uh, diligently so in order to optimize irrigation as well as uh, for us in Brunei managing the soil nutrition, nutrient yeah, in order to ensure that we have um, we improve in the self-sufficiency that I mentioned earlier on. So there is a need for policy. Okay so some of the policy we highlighted was basically for paddy leveling and preparation so this could explore for the focus of physical properties for proper and efficient irrigation system to look into the soil analysis where we want to condition as well as to preserve it for long for long term to actually look into the natural element weather and climate pest control and the cultivation density and rice variety so these are some of the um, policy recommendations that we have uh, we have submitted to our ministry um, just to share a little bit from, from from our university so we actually have several centers we actually have three main centers, Center for Innovative Engineering, Center for Research in Agri-Food Science and Research, as well as Center for Transport Research. In these centers, we actually have several research trusts, yeah? So maybe we can collaborate with them because at the moment, we have um, the research trust leaders have actually visited IBTE Agro and we actually look at embarking on a few projects. So as you can see, there's a drone as well there. Yeah? 
Yeah. So some of the we have signed the MOUs basically with ABT Agros as well as Innovero. So and then so we actually embarking on drone projects and as I mentioned, motion of technology for ABT Agro. Yeah. So in summary, basically these are the recommended and suggestion in order for us to improve our self-sufficiency for paddy plantation in Brunei. So to look into lesser land leveling required if privatization of lesser land required is necessary to ensure that everyone limes the land, you know, to prevent flush so that you don't um, you don't overuse your water. To adopt the alternate wetting and drying because of this, we can actually, you know, the, the water reliance will not be that as much. And to follow the weather patterns and element and so that we can actually uh, regulate it towards the weather pattern. Yeah. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. So I would like to acknowledge this respective uh, organization that have assisted us in gathering all this information. So I pass it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rida, for a, a very fantastic presentation. Okay, This is a very interesting project. And I think a lot of data and information from the presentation we need to digest. Okay, And um, uh, as we know that rice is our uh, staple food, um, the research related to this crop keep uh, growing, growing from, from the planting site until the end use. So for, I think for the breeders or for the agronomists, finding a suitable variety or better planting condition or techniques uh, to suit the surrounding condition will be the focal point. But for engineers like you, uh, doctor, and most of the participants today, uh, the technology or I can say the smart uh, system eh, will be the best solution uh, to overcome the problem facing by this crop or any other crops in the uh, in the respective country. Okay, uh, So I guess this industrial revolution is needed. Uh, really, we need this uh, uh, revolution uh, for this sector. Okay, Inshallah, doctor, we will discuss further during the Q&A session because I think uh, the participant can wait to ask questions on this matter. Okay, thank you again, uh, Dr. Vida. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, finally, uh, finally, yet importantly, okay, we next move to the third distinguished uh, speaker, Associate Professor Idira Prabhasari from Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Okay, uh, currently, uh, Professor Indira is the Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture of the University Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta. Uh, she obtained her PhD uh, from the University of Melbourne, Australia in the field of botany. Okay, her recent uh, research focus uh, is in a modified atmosphere packaging, MEP. And uh, today, um, Dr. Uh, Indira will present the importance of uh, post-harvest innovation during COVID-19 pandemic. So Dr. Indira, the time is yours. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Professor Samsia. And uh, before I start uh, my presentation, I would like to say uh, thank you to all distinguished participants uh, and then distinguished uh, uh, speakers. And I want to share, start share my screen. Oh. Mm. Oh, um, hold on. Uh, Do you have any problem, bro? Yes, uh, hold on. Why I can't... Uh, so is that okay if the uh, the committee share uh, my PPT because I don't I don't know why I can't share my screen from from here. Uh, the slide is already on the screen. Is this it's, it's already on the screen. Yes. Uh, which the, one in? Um, with the picture, I think of the campus. Is it? I can. Uh, drive uh, box and but there is oh hold on no, yes I, I can see my presentation there in this picture but uh, 
I can't. I, I can I cannot share from my from my computer. Okay. Oh dear. Oh dear, dear. What's wrong? Uh, Microsoft Surfing, Google Drive, Fox. Oh. Uh, we have set you as the co-host. Share screen. Yes, I'm so sorry, but I can't share my uh, my PPT from my computer. So, uh, is it possible for the com uh, committee to share my PPT? Yes, it is possible. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Thank you. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, it's already shared by the committee, so you just can start talking and then we will Okay. the slide off. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, Honorable Rector of Universitas Andalas, uh, the Dean of Faculty of Agriculture Universitas uh, Andalas, and Dr. Kandra, distinguished speakers and uh, participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, quite an honor uh, to give a talk in this uh, uh, a distinguished International Conference, ICCAB, or International Conference on Sustainable Agriculture and uh, Biosystem 2021. Uh, the theme of this conference is uh, Toward Sustainable Agricultural and Biosystem Under Global Pandemic. And in line with the theme, my presentation will elaborate on how losses of agricultural products uh, increase due to the pandemic and how to prevent it. Uh, next. Now, uh, this is the, uh, I'm sorry, the previous slide, please. Ah, thank you. Now, uh, in this presentation, I would like to talk about the agriculture and COVID-19, uh, especially in Indonesia, and then post harvest losses, just like Professor Sajif mentioned uh, earlier, and then the treatment uh, to reduce losses, especially for horticulture product. And then, uh, well, some of the treatment, of course, already succeeded, but some of them still need improvement. And then uh, finally, the, the summary. Uh, next, please. Uh, yes, next, please. Uh, uh, just sk uh, skip this slide, the next. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, as an agrarian country, agriculture is uh, important, quite important for uh, our country, Indonesia, uh, not only to feed the people, but uh, also to provide the job uh, for approximately 49 million people, uh, which is representing uh, approximately 29% of total labor force in Indonesia. Now, um, rice is the, the staple food in Indonesia, just like any other Southeast Asian countries. And it is one of the primary uh, agricultural products beside palm oil, cassava, cacao, and then uh, other aromatic products. Uh, such like spices, for example, the cinnamon, nutmeg, and etc. Next, please. Uh, now, if we look at the slide, uh, look at uh, the, if you look at the slide and then look at the data of Indonesian uh, export in 2020 and 2021, the biggest export was from industry. However, if we look at closely, the export actually included agricultural based products such as, uh, such as CPO, uh, rubber, and etc. So, in other words, agriculture contributes to the country's uh, income significantly. Next, please. Ah, thank you. Now, the severe challenges in agriculture affected by the global economic situation that caused uh, by the increased demand for food and energy, the rapid population growth, the obstacles on distribution, and the pandemic and climate change. Uh, we all know that at the moment we suffer uh, from the COVID-19 attack. Now, altogether, give many setbacks uh, for the development of agriculture. It's uh, quite a shame because agriculture's 
place really important for uh, our life to give uh, to give food and then to give uh, other comfort next now uh, we look at the uh, the impact of climate change in Indonesia. If uh, uh, we look at the picture now, we can see that the uh, the effect of climate change uh, gives the bad impacts in Indonesia, uh, starting from disappearance of small islands. Uh, we have actually uh, Indonesia actually has uh, seventeen thousand islands, but uh, start from the big island until the small islands, and. Uh, uh, that's uh, so. So maybe it's not seventeen thousand uh, islands anymore because of this di disappearance of uh, some small islands, and then also uh, give uh, impact to the salt water nutrition. Less less till the food scarcity. So it's quite bad impact for uh, uh, for our country. Next. Yes. Now that's uh, the picture about a natural disaster uh, happened in Indonesia. Actually, it happens in uh, my city, Yogyakarta. So in 2010, there was eruption uh, from Mount Merapi. So Mount Merapi is one of the active volcano in our countries. And when it erupted, it killed over 1,000 livestock and destroyed over 1,000 hectares of agricultural land. So this is quite a bad impact, which is uh, caused a severe uh, uh, severe uh, devastates, uh, devastate, uh, devastation for our uh, country. Uh, especially for near the Maldives. Next. Now, uh, the, about the, the agriculture and COVID-19. Uh, in the early days of the crisis of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it was thought uh, that in Indonesia, the COVID-19 pandemic would have only little impact on agriculture. Uh, however, after uh, a while, uh, we can see that the impact of COVID-19 are both significant and highly differentiated. Moreover, it's not only about the production of agriculture product, uh, but also beyond production, such as losses of horticultural uh, products. So now what we, uh, what we face is not only insecurity in food production, but also insecurity in uh, nutrition uh, uh, security. Next. Now we uh, we can see or we can uh, look at the report from uh, John Fritz Gerald in uh, 2020 about the agriculture and also uh, and COVID-19 in our country. Uh, when we look at the report, now uh, the total land in Indonesia is approximately 1.9 uh, million kilometers square, and 31.5 percent uh, is agricultural land. That's why I mentioned that our country is actually. Agri uh, agrarian country. Now, the pandemic was first recorded in Indonesia on the 2nd of uh, March uh, 2021. And the impact on agriculture was significant. And what concerned us is the key risk multipliers like agricultural pests and uh, the disease, the climate change, and then nutrition and the losses of uh, agricultural products, especially in here, I would uh, I like to mention about uh, hearty, uh, horticultural products. Next. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the post harvest losses and then uh, the COVID-19. So the COVID-19 gives uh, some setback, especially in the value chain. So people getting more difficult to get food, and uh, but not also uh, about the uh, value chain, uh, especially during transportation. So the tra transportation of horticultural products will need a longer period, a longer time to reach the consumer and because food and uh, fruit and vegetables are very perishable products so the longer time will make the uh, their losses getting increased 
because it takes uh, longer to uh, reach uh, to reach the consumer and it's uh, quite a same and it's quite a concern especially because some people then will get nutrition in security due to this uh, pandemic next now, uh, one of the solutions that uh, uh, some experts already discussed is the collaboration, what we call uh, among uh, collaborations among academician and then the business and government and community as a strategy to implement. Now, the collaboration between university and industry, for instance, is a joint that uh, that's uh, uh, one of our uh, project is uh, cooperation uh, cooperated uh, with uh, the local government uh, in uh, post harvest innovation and then uh, also the government community and university can work together to provide scholarship for agriculture students uh, like for example in my own university we gave more scholarship uh, for the students due to this pandemic otherwise the students uh, 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 many students cannot afford uh, to continue uh, their study because of this pandemic situation next Now, this is the, the picture about uh, the apples, the senescence process of the apple fruit. So the picture represents the senescence process and uh, in human, we call it the aging process actually. Now, the process is perfectly natural. That's uh, quite a natural uh, process happen in, in the fruits after we harvest it from uh, the plant. We don't want to stop the, the senescence process because it's impossible. But but what we want to do is uh, to slow down the respiration rate so the senescence process then can go slow down and then the self life can uh, have a, a longer uh, time. Now, uh, why we need to uh, to, uh, to prolong the self life of fruit and uh, vegetables? But because of the distribution and food or the transportation in many cases, uh, uh, rich, uh, in many cases, they will cause the, uh, the losses of our horticultural products. It can be because of the injury and uh, because of the pathogen attacks. So uh, that's why when uh, the food, uh, the fruit and vegetable reach the consumer, some of them already uh, rotten and no one's like the rotten fruits and vegetables. That's why we try uh, to uh, to give some treatment to the fruit and vegetables so they can have a, a longer uh, self life. Okay, next, please. Now uh, that's uh, that's the data from the. Uh, the UNFAO about the, the losses you can see there and the UNFAO initiate currently uses the figures of 45 uh, percent of losses that, that's quite a lot and uh, many international development authorities just like the UNFAO the World Bank and then the USAID and some journal article authors uh, citing that uh, typically a general range of 30 until 50 percent of uh, post harvest losses which is quite a lot that's why we need to do some innovation uh, in terms of uh, prolong the self life of uh, fruit and vegetables to prevent the losses of the horticultural uh, products next please now that's uh, some of uh, uh, the cause of uh, uh, the decay or uh, the losses uh, happen in the fruit and vegetables. Now all fresh horticultural products are high in water content, which is good because we consume fruit and uh, fruits especially to get the fresh uh, water uh, uh, for ourselves. But because they have, uh, they are very high in water content. The microbial attacks is quite, uh, quite se uh, severe, and it's quite frequent that the fruits get rotten because of the microbial uh, attacks. Now, uh, the fruit and vegetables are also susceptible to attack by bacteria and fungi. 
uh, with pathological, uh, pathological breakdown. And also that we all know that the best quality of uh, horticultural products is at the time of harvest. When product is not maintained at proper temperature, harmful pathogens can thrive. Now, not only decreasing self life, but also increasing the risk of foodborne uh, pathogens. This is especially important for leafy greens and other uh, high risk products. Now, as we can see on the slide in the picture, there are four top causes of reduced shelf life of horticultural products. Uh, those are physical damage, uh, actually happen during transportation, for example, bruises and scars, and pathogens, and then temperature and uh, humidity, and also the hormone uh, ethylene which is uh, in, uh, induced the senescence, uh, uh, the senescence uh, process of the fruit and uh, vegetables. Now we will have a look at how to manage these four things uh, uh, in, in terms of to, to prevent the damage of fruit and vegetables. Next, please. Yes, uh, next, please. Yes. Now, we, uh, uh, in this slide, we see the chilling injury, uh, which is most uh, common problem in, in uh, fruit and uh, vegetable when exposed with the low temperature. In agricultural practices, we use low temperature to transport and also keep the food. But unfortunately, most fruits and vegetables of tropical and subtropical origin are injured when exposed to low temperatures. Now, critical temperatures of this type of chilling injury range from 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. Now, certain fruits and vegetables of uh, temperate zone origin uh, are also susceptible, uh, susceptible to chilling injury and one of the symptoms of chilling injury is now if we look at the picture uh, we can see that's that's the study from Suo uh, at all in uh, 2018 shows that lignin in both the flesh and the core gradually accumulated during long-term cold storage now the lignin content was significantly high in the core than in the flesh. Now we can see because the lignin is stained with uh, fluoroglucinol HDL, so giving the red color. So it's the very intense in the lignified kiwi compared to the normal one. The accumulation of lignin in the flesh was decreased uh, after treating with uh, one MCP. We can see at the curve, uh, but the more serious lignification was observed in core tissues, something that we should think about because uh, uh, if uh, lignification uh, happened in the core tissue, that the consumers do not like to consume uh, the kiwi. Next. Now, uh, another losses in uh, horticultural products is the, the pathogen or microbial attack. We can see in the picture uh, the selected common spoilage uh, microorganisms in fruit, picture A, and then in vegetables, picture B, and then fruit juice products or uh, picture C. We also noticed that the post harvest development of stem and rot of mango uh, caused by the fungal pathogen, uh, La Lassio diuplodia diubrome, started early lesion from infected uh, stem ends. We can see in the in the a in the picture a and then the symptoms then enlarge and then the process uh, progress outwards the center fruit image we can see that and eventually the spoilage uh, lesion encompasses the entire fruit uh, with a collapse of mango flesh so the uh, the flesh then very uh, runny uh, with water and uh, people uh, won't like it. And then in the picture of B, we can see the spoilage of white onion caused by the Aspergillus niger. The characteristic black staining caused by fungal conidia appears to be linearly distributed on infected onions. We can see that uh, from the picture indicated by black arrowhead. Now, uh, yes, next please. Next, please. 
uh, yes. Now that's the picture of uh, avocado. Yeah. So the next slide uh, showing the bruises uh, happen in the avocado. As I mentioned earlier, that the bruise and the scars uh, mostly happen during the transportation and during harvesting. And the most common causes of bruising during post harvest operation are uh, excessive compression and impact force. Now, compression is common during loading, transportation, and also storage. We uh, because we stack uh, sometimes we stack uh, the fruits, and including damage uh, which occurs during uh, harvesting when uh, beans are overfilled and then stacked. Yeah, we stack all the fruits, and uh, finally some of the fruits then get the uh, scars of uh, bruise, and then it can uh, speed up. Uh, uh, speed up the senescence process and then also uh, make the microbial attacks uh, quite easy to attack fruit and vegetables. Next. Now, uh, ethylene, as I mentioned, is the hormone, uh, the plant hormone, which is responsible for the senescence uh, process and also for maturations. Uh, that's why the, some scientists then playing around uh, with modification of uh, ethylene, uh, whether it's to speed up the maturation or to try to slow down the senescence uh, process. Now, uh, ethylene is... Uh, um, a plant hormone which stimulates different aspects of uh, plant uh, function. It increases cellular uh, respiration, which in turn increases the metabolic rate. After produce has been harvested, uh, harvested, this increase in respiration will shorten the cell life. And that's something that we don't want to happen. That's why we modified the ethylene so that we can uh, prolong the cell life of fruit and uh, vegetable. Now, the picture shows the effect of uh, post-harvest ethylene accumulation uh, and ethylene scavenger on the ri uh, ripening and also the cell life of fruit and uh, vegetables. We can see that while ethylene accumulation triggers uh, ripening and therefore shorten the cell life, deleted ethylene by uh, using ethylene scavenger, so they will uh, uh, attach the uh, ethylene, uh, can prolong the cell life by delaying the ripening process. Uh, next. Now, uh, now, after uh, seeing some losses uh, 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 in happen in fruit and vegetables, now the next question is how to prevent them. Now, because we don't want to provide consumers with uh, rotten uh, food, with the rotten mangoes, with the rotten apples, uh, and because we also want agricultural practitioners have a good profit for their uh, business, of course. Now, basically, there are uh, four ways uh, to reduce losses by uh, manipulating environment and then temperature, humidity, and commodity treatment. Temperature management is the most uh, effective tool for maintaining quality and safety and for extending the post-harvest life of fresh horticultural commodities. Now, but however, yeah, Horti horticultural crops are sensitive temperature and they can have freezing injury or chilling injury when exposed to low temperatures. So we have to play around with uh, the temperatures, uh, how many degrees it's uh, suitable uh, for uh, the uh, horticultural products because if it's uh, the, uh, the fruit or vegetables are quite sensitive, they can have chilling injury or freezing injury. So we don't want it. But if the temperatures, it's not uh, quite, it's not uh, enough, uh, low, so the self life is still uh, very short. So we want to keep the, uh, we want to prolong the self life, but protect uh, the fruit and vegetables for uh, chilling injury. Now, in uh, in doing that, sometimes we combine by adding uh, uh, other treatment or give the special 
packaged by using uh, MAP or modified atmosphere pa uh, packaging and by adding also one MCP or methyl cyclopane uh, to the uh, fruit and vegetables and also edible film who will wrap the fruit and vegetables so they can have uh, a longer uh, shelf life. Next. Okay, now uh, we can see, uh, oh, I'm so sorry because the picture is so small. It's, yeah, uh, but it's, uh, yes. So this is the weight loss rate of the control group increased uh, sharply in the late storage stage. And, uh, and the MA plus one MCP, so the modified atmosphere packaging combined with the one MCP treatment group was significantly lower uh, than that. Uh, however, uh, if we look at closely, there's no significant difference was found between the modified at, uh, atmosphere packaging group and also uh, the adding uh, one MCP treatment before 50 days of storage. Now, the fruit firmness in all groups progressively decrease during the whole storage. Yeah, we, we understand that uh, when uh, fruit and vegetables uh, uh, store in the storage uh, by the time during senescent process or during maturation, uh, uh, the flesh will be softened because of the pectin uh, degradation. Now, ethylene was produced in a large amount from uh, 15 days in that case, and the increased rate of control treatment was higher than that in other treatments. Now, we can see also that the peak of ethylene appear at the 22 day of storage, and the modified atmosphere packaging treatment uh, group was significantly lower than the control group. And the adding of an MCP, treatment then further inhibited the production of ethylene and so from this uh, research we can say that by modifying the uh, by modifying the percentage of gain in the storage what we call atmosphere packaging and then combine with one mcp who, uh, which will inhibit the synthesis indirectly of uh, ethylene, so it can re, uh, it can uh, slow down the senescent process, and in that case can uh, pro of uh, the fruit. Next, okay, so uh, in that slides that uh, the treatment by coating. Uh, treatment or uh, coating the fruit and vegetables using uh, edible uh, film. So the coating treatments were uh, very good in firmness uh, uh, preservation. Uh, one of my uh, uh, and by using 1.5 percent and one percent based edible uh, coatings had a significant influence on fruit firmness. So we can maintain the firmness of uh, the fruit because uh, consumers do not want to eat, you know, the mushy, very uh, mushy uh, flesh uh, of uh, the fruit. Now, the effectiveness of uh, CMC coatings on maintaining fruit firmness could be the result of the existence of carbon oxalic groups in the chemical structure of CMC that causes hydrogen bonding inside the coating matrix and between the coating with the fruit peel, which in turn then cause positive effects on firmness preservation. And I think Professor Sajif already mentioned that uh, using the wax during the waxing process then can uh, also maintain the firmness and also act as a barrier uh, from uh, microbial attacks for the fruit fruits and vegetables. Next, please. Ah, now that's uh, also one of uh, the research of our group uh, using the, uh, the edible coating to protect or to prolong the uh, 
uh, this self life of uh, salaka so it's combined uh, using some of uh, the gel the local gels adding in the edible film and then coating uh, coating for fruit so that the uh, the self life can be uh, longer next please yeah, okay okay uh, it's almost finished uh, now uh, about the arginine we also uh, used uh, the arginine uh, for one of our project to maintain uh, the the self life of uh, the salaka uh, we tried the arginine to maintain the self life of salaka and other and also other fruits other local fruits just like uh, banana and the results very uh, promising uh, very promising, but uh, then we will concern about the adding, uh, you know, adding uh, production because the arginine is not, it's not that, uh, it's not that cheap, and sometimes it's difficult for for the small farmers to add the arginine for uh, for the treatment. Now, uh, next slide, please. Now this also show the uh, uh, the color measurement indicated another role in uh, browning development as uh, I mentioned earlier in the fresh cut salaka are the uh, fresh because if we cut the the fruit it will be quite easy for the fruit then to be attacked by the microbial and then to have the senescence uh, process it will speed up the senescence process just like professor sajif mentioned that if the fruits get injured it will you know speed up the respiration rate and at the end it will speed up also the senescence process so the fruit it can be uh, uh, decayed uh, or uh, yes it, it's not suitable for consumption anymore now uh, by using the arginine it showed that the arginine can you know can uh, pre uh, prevent all this uh, uh, all this uh, you know all the microbial attack and also can slow down the senescence however when we look at the color measurement that's indicated another role in browning uh, development because the browning still happen so that's possibly the role of uh, enzyme another enzyme uh, in that case maybe the role of ppo polyphenol oxidase and also uh, and maybe also the role of dod uh, that's something that we need to examine uh, further next now, uh, for the summary, we can uh, we can uh, see that the innovation in uh, post harvest treatment is needed. Uh, it's not only to uh, to enhance the food security, but it's also to enhance the nutrition security because if uh, uh, the losses happen in the horticultural products it's not only the quantity but also the the uh, the quality because of the uh, the ruin or decay of because of the antioxidant uh, it's not uh, present anymore or less concentration and also the vitamin c the ascorbic uh, acid and etc that's we need to uh, to do uh, more research, especially in the innovation on uh, post harvest, especially during the pandemic, so that it will uh, give uh, or it will strengthen the food security and also nutrition security at the same time. Okay, I think I will uh, end up my presentation by saying hamdala. The technical. Uh, for the technical accident, uh, I don't know what's wrong, but it's it's not possible for me to say my presentation uh, from my computer. Ah, this is the the picture of our team in Department of Agro Technology. We have uh, uh, some project uh, currently. Uh, we cooperate with Asad Sat University in Thailand with uh, with. With the project, with the project of modified atmosphere packaging, and then adding uh, one MCP and med, uh, modified of uh, ethylene hormone. Okay, I will uh, uh, 
saying thank you for all your attention and I will give uh, back my uh, time to Madam Chairperson, Professor Samsia. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for a very informative presentation. So you do need to apologize because your presentation is very interesting. And I do agree that uh, we have to consider both quality and also the quantity, not only the quantity, but also the quality. And we do hope that uh, active researchers like you, Prof, and your team in this field of post harvest can slow down whatever impact that uh, we are facing now due to the um, change and also the um, COVID-19. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me thanking uh, Professor Indra Pabasari for, for the sharing. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Professor Sanjeev, uh, Prof. Vida and Prof. Indira, so, uh, you have presented your finding um, and the participant has uh, listened to your presentation. So, so thank you very much uh, for this excellent presentation and I hope that all of you are ready for the Q&A session. Okay. So I open the uh, session. Um, uh, I hope participate any any question from the participant please state your name and where you're from because we want to know um, uh, your background okay uh, at least your name and uh, your, your university and uh, if you don't want to speak um, you just have to write your question in the chat room so I will read it out uh, for you and the speaker will uh, uh, answer the question okay so uh, may I read the first um, question? Eh? From uh, the first question comes from uh, the community, actually committee, committee members, Reni Ika. Uh, this question is for Dr. Wida. Okay, may you explain more Brunei policy for paddy plantation? Is there any subsidies fertilizer for farmers in Brunei? Actually, Prof. Vida already uh, said something in the chat room, but I think uh, you you want to uh, explain further, right? Yes. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. So answering to the question, basically in Brunei, uh, one of the problems that we have uh, uh, was because we, our, all, our farmers are actually secondary farmers. They are not primary farmers. So the the back, the understanding and... Um, to plant, etc., is basically they have to go through a certain school. So we actually in Brunei, we actually have um, established this school for all new farmers to actually go to. Okay, so in two thousand nine, basically the uh, it was uh, specifically more on paddy. Uh, His Majesty has actually highlighted that uh, there is a need for us for a national rice policy. So they actually embarked on two thousand nine. It was since two thousand nine, and uh, we're trying to aim, you know. A of sufficiency of 50%, but unfortunately, we only managed to achieve 4%. And in, to answer that, uh, in terms of incentive, basically, the government has put in a lot of money into it. So in one of the <coughs> programs, intensive program, we called it SIPA. SIPA it stands for Scheme Intensive Pertanian dan Agri Makanan. So in this, basically, all the uh, farmers are actually given um, incentive, you know, 50% subsidized in terms of cost to, for them to purchase uh fertilizers, you know, uh, machineries, preparation for the, the plots, etc. These are all 50% subsidies. And then purchasing buyback for their, their output, which is the yield, it is bought in, uh, in the cost of $1.60 per kilo. So it's actually paying more. So the government actually tried to encourage more you know, uh, farmers to grow plant, to grow paddy, specifically to grow to grow to reach that particular yield self self sufficiency that we're aiming for. So yeah, so going back to your question, do we do the uh, government do provide subsidy, and it's actually putting a lot of um, pressure to the government actually because we have not reached that target yet, but we already have put in a lot of effort. So that, that's the reason why maybe the adoption of technology can assist. So I was trying to state in the very first place that the policy was not in the irrigation, but the paddy policy is there. But for irrigation, that's the reason why I highlighted some uh, in my irrigated first before they actually embark on other things. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I hope uh, when Erika satisfied with the answer, and if you still need 
to uh, to clarify more I and mean, then get to us after that maybe you can uh, email uh, Dr. Lida for for more uh, elaboration okay we have next question from uh, Dr. Noi Hartini Dohaji okay she's the one of my colleagues from uh, UITM uh, working on as well so post uh, this question is for Prof Indira Assalamualaikum. I am Martini. Post harvest losses percentage of de developing countries are higher mostly at early post harvest operation. Example harvesting and transportation due to our lack of technology in this area as compared to well developed countries where their are losses most at the end of the post harvest uh, pipeline. Okay, the storage and the disease. In your opinion, should we developing countries focus on research, especially on the early stage uh, post harvest operation? Thank you in advance for your opinion. Okay, Prof. Uh, okay. Please answer the yes. question. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, interesting question. It's uh, difficult to answer actually. Well, yes, in developing countries, the losses is uh, higher. Uh, uh, compared to the developed countries because uh, we have a lack of technology and also we have a lack of uh, finance so it's uh, the the losses happen in the developing countries just like in uh, indonesia is higher compared to developed country and then uh, especially it happened during the early states of post harvest for example uh, 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 during the harvest and also the transportation yes indeed because uh, just like like in, in my country, in Indonesia, you know, when we uh, transport uh, from one city to another, especially because the, uh, in Indonesia, there are so many lands and so many small islands. So the transportation need uh, quite some time, but it is uh, expensive to have uh, a truck with the chiller inside. Uh, and not uh, not every farmers, especially the small scale of farmers, uh, can afford that kind of luxury. So what happens sometimes they modify the technique of uh, uh, post harvest, for example, and then they wrap by the newspaper, uh, by newspaper, and then put some uh, white cement and cabbage and everything to uh, to make the longer shelf life. So uh, your question about whether we was in the early states of the uh, harvesting, I would say, uh, yes, the early states is quite important because if we don't harvest uh, wisely and properly, uh, so there will be many injured and then uh, with the injured, uh, so they will easier for microbes to attack the fruit and vegetables. And then also the injured will, uh, will speed up the senescent process and at the end it will uh, uh, shorten the self life of fruit and vegetables. So we have to uh, make more research in the, at the early stage of, uh, of uh, the post harvest, uh, uh, in the early stage of post harvest management. But uh, however, uh, the, the latter states, for example, the uh, storage, because it, in Indonesia, it's the humid, and so the microbial will the microbes will grow easier in the humid condition. So, although we more focus in the early states, I would say that in the late states, for example, during the story, important because of the climate condition, the weather condition, in especially in. in Indonesia because it's uh, humid. I think also almost the same with uh, Malaysia because uh, it's uh, uh, average. We have relative humidity around 90%, which is quite uh, humid. And it's quite easy for the microbes to grow up in that such of uh, uh, condition. I hope I, uh, I answer your question. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Oh, or maybe uh, Prof uh, Sajif, you want to say something since this is uh, this is your area too, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe you can share your opinion in the in the uh, perspective. De definitely. Uh, so that's what I'm uh, mentioning in my presentation as well. That once we harvest the crop, so we should go for the pack house operations a little bit. So by doing that, we can uh, save a lot of, uh, you can say, we can 
the losses get reduced if we follow those procedures generally what the farmers in india also they are not following those procedures once they follow these procedures uh, slowly and slowly we we'll, we can cut down on the losses similarly for the transportation if they are doing it, uh, in india particularly during the summers so it's it's very hot over here so temperature rises below uh, above 40 degrees centigrade and if we have to send the uh, uh, horticulture produce for 2 3 is so around 72 hours so there are little things that should be considered like putting a lighter canvas cover so instead of uh, using you can say the dark color so it will save a little bit of heat so again there can be you can say some in the open uh, 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 transport so if fresh air window we have when uh, vehicles are moving at night so that uh, that window can uh, introduce fresh air or you can say relatively cool air into the uh, during the transportation into that system so that those things need to be followed if we are going for the you can say refrigerated vehicles and all that so if it is not possible to purchase these so uh, here in india so what they are doing they they are renting it out some of the people they are they are having these reefer vans and they rent it out to the farmers so that they can take their produce to distant places so that's how by using uh, these techniques where the losses are more at the initial stage we can manage the things so i think uh, that can do a little bit thank you yeah thank you very much uh, prof Okay, so um, we have, I think, we have one one question. This is for um, okay. Thank you for your presentation from Imam Yadiki. Thank you for your presentation. I have question about MEP technique in preservation stage. Uh, besides food, can a uh, map technique used for other agricultural products? And are there any information related to the use of this technique? Okay. Uh, I think uh, I'm not sure about other products uh, besides fruit because in my project, uh, I use fruits uh, for the MAP technique. For modified atmosphere packaging technique, so we play around with the gas. So we take out the the oxygen gas and then uh, give uh, argon uh, argon uh, gas, so it can prolong the shelf life of fruits. But I'm not sure if uh, using uh, other than fruits, for example, maybe uh, using other uh, food products uh, like uh, the the dairy, the fish, and maybe the meat uh, i'm i'm not sure because i have no experience uh, my team just uh, focus on the fruit uh, project but i've i ever heard that mip also uh, used for the fish uh, products and for the meat products but uh, i have uh, i didn't have experience of uh, using other products than fruit thank you Uh, the, the, uh, okay, so I open, uh, invite more questions from the floor. You can on your, um, unmute your microphone, introduce yourself and uh, see what your question is. Anyone from the participants? Maybe um, I can ask first. Eh? Um, uh, for Dr. Vida, okay. My my uh, my question is may, maybe it's a little bit uh, different um, out of context of engineering, but I want to know the aspect uh, that you mentioned in your uh, talk just now is the suitable rice variety okay, that can uh, uh, that can be used. I mean, one of the factors. Uh, one of the aspects that can be considered. So how 
far this aspect being considered in your project? Do you, I mean, use the whatever variety that available in uh, Brunei or you introduce a new variety from other countries uh, in order to uh, suit the project, your project? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Sharifah. Um, so basically, in terms of um, rice variety, to, I think it's for every ASEAN countries. We are actually uh, assisted uh, in, we have people from IRI, we have people. So we're actually looking into this one specific uh, variety called Sembada 188. At the same time, it's called Tite, and another one is called Tite as well. So we are focusing on these two varieties where, as I mentioned, it has have to uh, resistance to quite a number of things and then it produces quite a number of uh, quite a big yield yeah so this is basically what we're focusing on and uh, just recently we were actually uh, approached by our, our our ministry to actually look into how we can actually produce this uh, locally because uh, during the covid situation we face a problem where the we have a shortage of seeds so it actually uh, stopped the the production so it, it affect our yield so uh, so that was one of the things that was you know quite alarming and then they, they immediately come to us with the uh, adoption of technology can be assisted it can be actually applied to uh, to help it grow in Brunei because as I mentioned earlier on if it's planted in Wasan uh, the same issues the same problem are being faced so the 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 amount of yield that is produced to, in, in that particular plot will not produce the same amount due to due to the shortage right because it have to be also subsidized to the respective uh, plot farmers so yeah we are looking into um these two specific um, varieties because as i mentioned before uh we are working one with philippines uh philippines is basically beras laila but beras laila is has now stopped because of the problem that i mentioned before uh because of the, it is prone to when it goes it goes heavy it goes down so it actually produces more um hampa you know the you know the so it's affecting lah. It's not really good to actually have beras laila. So they they're now moving for beras sembada sembada one eight eight. Beras sembada one and eight is now uh, the 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 grain that is being approved as well as suggested by by uh, Department of Agriculture and Agri Food. Because as Apple may mentioned just now, uh, any any assistance are basically from the Department of Agriculture and Agri Food, and all the seeds that's coming in, it have to be uh, uh, tested first before they actually planted in Brunei at the same time for food security wise. So uh, it, hopefully if we're able to produce it in Brunei with this grain, we can actually secure uh, quite a few in terms of our food security. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yida. Uh, is there any question from the participants? Okay, since um, no more question from the floor, so uh, before we end the uh, session, I would like to invite uh, each speaker to give a one minute conclusion yeah? a statement before I uh, mean uh, in whatever I mean, we have presented just now. So we will start with uh, Professor Sajid. Yes, sure. Okay. Can we just give so, a, a conclusion statement? Thank you. Okay. So basically what I feel, so in my closing remarks, so I would like to say that it's a global challenge and particularly for the developing countries. So we have to reduce the losses and for uh, as scientists, it's our duty and we have to answer these challenges. So I hope by sharing uh, such type of knowledge like we are doing here at the international conference. So with one another, so we can help our farmers of our countries to do better. We can convey them the better technologies and all that, and they can have better returns uh, related to their yield. So that's how these types of, uh, you can say, these conferences are uh, very important, but because we exchange the knowledge with one another. So, so that was it, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. And we move to uh, Prof. Vida Susanti. Thank you. So my, my remark will be, um, you know, we as researcher, we, we try to find a solution. We try to buy, find best solution that suits. But at the same time, if we do not share this with the 
people, the farmers, basically, it will deficit the purpose. You know, they will sit, still uh, use the same old techniques without uh, understanding that the use of all these technologies, new new approach, new you know, new technologies will be helpful for them. So I think one of the ways is basically to make our findings uh, more layman term as well, so it could be more digestible to them, more um, more they can actually more gain more from it you know so in, in, the, in the aspect in, in Brunei especially because our farmers are basically the retired ones uh, so they, they are the ones who are going to embark on this but at the same time we are now uh, trying to um, record that fish our new 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 young farmers by a different of technology so that is our new uh, approach now with respect to this so we, we are very fortunate because recently with mice we have a, a conference where we encourage where we we're able to um, um uh, recall that it, it involved quite a number of youngsters and we are able to see that they are interested in quite uh, lucrative crops yeah so hydroponics everything are being now uh, introduced in Brunei as well so it's quite interesting to see that there's a lot of youngsters who are now more involved to agriculture so I hope that it will also help us in terms of ensuring the sustainable agriculture towards in, in the future thank you okay thank you uh, prof okay now um, move to prof Indira for your uh, conclusion remark. Oh, yes, my conclusion remark will be that uh, during this uh, disruption era, uh, especially during the pandemic, which is the, uh, very concerning uh, for the few, uh, food security and also for the nutrition security. So the innovation, especially uh, for uh, uh, for prevent the, the losses is uh, quite needed. Uh, but uh, we also need to work together closely uh, with the, the government and also with the businessmen and also with the community in this case and with the farmers so that all the innovation then can be implemented and that uh, all the innovation that can really be used by the farmers and also by uh, cooperate, uh, cooperation with the, the government will make us uh, easier and also with cooperation with the businessmen uh, will uh, make us easier to implement uh, our uh, innovation or our uh, research. I think that's all, uh, Prof. Samsia. Okay, thank you very much, Professor uh, Indira, Professor Susanti, and Professor Sajid. So I think everyone here have the same thought. We we want to produce something okay from our research, from our work for the betterment, especially for our people and the in the agriculture sectors. So we, we hope that uh, whatever we have discussed today will help uh, in terms of uh, improving. Okay. Uh, the, the sectors and also give the ideas to especially to the young researchers um, who participate uh, in this uh, conference okay, to get uh, to get more ideas and uh, proceed with their research. Okay? So ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you to all of our speakers, our honorable speakers for their illuminating presentations and discussion. Thank you very much also to our to the participants for your engagement. This is a very fruitful discussion. Thank you, or I should say, uh, terima kasih. And I will pass back the session to the MC. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you very much for informative and insightful presentation from our distinguished speakers and our moderator. This time, I would like to call the speakers and moderator to receive the token of appreciation from Andalas University to our honorable speakers and moderator. Firstly, thank you to our first speaker in honor to Professor Sajaf Ratan Sharma from Punjab Agricultural University, India. Secondly, thank you to our second speaker in honor to Dr. Wida Susanti Haji Suhaili from University Technology Brunei, Brunei Darussalam. Thirdly, thank you to our third speaker 
in honor to Associate Professor Indira Prabasari, PhD, from University Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, Indonesia. We would like to thank to our moderator in honor to Associate Professor T.S. Dr. Shamsiah Abdullah to receive the token of appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the agendas we have presented to you this afternoon as we have finished the second session from our distinguished speakers. Coming up, coming up to the last session, we are going to have the parallel session. The upcoming parallel session will be conducted to seven topics and divided into nine rooms. They are room one, intended to the topic precision farming and socio-economic value chains in agricultural system. Room two, intended to the topic smart, smart technologies in agricultural system. Room 3, intended to the topic biosystem and biorosis. Room 4, intended to the topic land and water resources. For room 5 to room 7, they are intended to the topic food technology. Room 8, intended to the topic agro-industrial production system. And room 9, intended to the renewable energy and biodiversity. For those who join the parallel session, please be note that our session will be started at 1 past 50 p.m. After the quick break, you can proceed into your presentation room. Also, some further information will be informed by our committee as soon as possible as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> 